You get into one of my podcasts, you get in to win. This is another, look, there's an episode coming up, I don't want to spoil, where we run into the same problem, where it's very hard to do an impression of this actor doing an accent. Uh, but I think it's good. I think you nailed that. Really? Yeah. 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 Because his accent is... It's Adam Driver doing a voice. You right, know what I mean? His it's voice not like... is so extreme as a baseline. Yes. That that's when you true. put a vocal choice on top of it, like, is there another Adam Driver performance where he fucks with his voice that much? You know what I'm saying? For I'm how much this guy besides, besides Gucci, I guess. But in Gucci, I feel like he was the He's, most toned down. He was. It's a light he touch. Was. It's a feather touch accent. Yeah. He, he, <laughs> Just he, at least he, compared to the... Uh... He, he is the Shailene Woodley of, of the house of Gucci. <laughs> yes, yes, right. He is the, the soft and gentle. Well, look, this is an episode coming out later that I don't want to spoil. But the last, the other version of this we cited was, unfortunately, it's been too long, the last time you were on the show... Nick Nolte in Lorenzo's oh Oil, my God. Yes. where it's like one of the most distinctive specific voices in the world, once again, attempting an Italian accent on top of it, and your brain sort of starts to get scrambled trying to listen to it. Yeah. Well, I, I actually- Get into one of my cores. I talked to Adam Driver about the accent in okay. Ferrari. And, and, so this and is why you're here. This is why you're the, here. The thing he said, I thought this was fascinating. I, I, these weren't his exact words, but but the the point he got across was that the accent doesn't exist. Like, it's not an actual Italian accent in so far as it's like an Italian person trying to speak English. Uh -huh. Like, these people are speaking Italian to each other. This is just kind of the, a, the conduit look, by which we It's a we great way to think about it. Right? So, right, so he's not... It's sort of the Star Trek rule of like, you don't actually know what language anyone is speaking here. There's some sort of yeah. universal no, translator. It is, look, yes. it is a thing I, I think about a tremendous amount that I think is weirdly under-discussed mm -hmm. when we, like, critique actors, yes. American actors doing accents, speaking in English, when you're like, right, but this would never happen. This isn't, right. this isn't them playing a character with a limited grasp of the English language, fighting through their accent to right. communicate to other English speakers. There this is like, yeah. we have a babble fish in our head. Right. Yeah, there aren't sounds they're trying to pronounce and right. failing to do so. Right. This is like fluid language. It's it's basically there so that it's not too distracting. Yes. That like 95% of the cast is in fact Italian speaking English. And it would just sound really weird if the three lead actors did not have some sort of accent. It's also, you know? right. It's fascinating to me that it remains kind of a no perfect solve question. Where there's, like, the approach like this, right? There's the approach like Ridley Scott's Napoleon. Everyone used their own voices. Right, okay. and we're just not even going to acknowledge it. Yeah. yeah, there'll be British guys, there'll be American guys, there'll be right. French people. No Fine. one even try. And right. then there's sort of the, like, Hunt for Red October Valkyrie. We're going to call it out. Mm -hmm. We're going to, in the language of the film, basically transition you into Avatar 2 does the same thing. Yep. Where it's like we're starting with everyone speaking the real language, and at some point we're like, and now we're transforming your interpretation. Right. Now you can understand everyone. Right. Right. It's magical. Yeah, my my favorite example of like a movie where they just do not care about the accents is probably Last Temptation of Christ. Which, That's one, right? Because yeah. and I st I still Kytel to this day me, think Jesus, you fucking right. Th 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 to, my to this over day, there. I think Kaitel gives like one of the greatest He's performances so of all time in that movie. I mean, second to Defoe, who gives, like, the greatest performance of all time. But but nobody will ever acknowledge that Keitel is so good because they're distracted by, you know, I guess his, what is it, his Queen's accent? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, what yeah. do you think Judah sounded like, <laughs> you know, with a thick British accent? No. Silence. That is a film yes. that's very similar to this oh, one. Oh, good call. Uh, right. Where it's like, you're Portuguese. Like, yes. you know, do an accent. Yeah. Don't worry about it. They're Portuguese, right? They're yes, Portuguese. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. I, I forgot if it was Spanish or Portuguese. They're, David, of course they're medieval Portuguese. Medieval Portuguese. It's Andrew Garfield and Adam Driver. How Andrew Garfield, question? Adam Driver, and Liam Neeson. The Portuguese, three most yeah. Portuguese men of all time. <laughs> yeah. Adam actually, Driver I, is leagues more Portuguese I, 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 than the other two. Actually, like, literally the, the three least Portuguese people of all time. <laughs> yeah. But that's, I mean, it's the same approach. It's like, yeah, just grow a beard. You're ethnic. You're like, yeah. right? Like, you're right. European. You're you're medieval. Who cares? Eat some pau de cao. Like and Liam that. Neeson, who never does an accent because he seems incapable of speaking in any other voice other than his own. Yes. He well, just sort of softens his accent yeah. if he's a, a quote-unquote American, right? Yes. Like, it's still there, but it's just less. Like, Michael Collins, he's full Irish. Right. 
fucking what's like a, a he's, he's the Jean Claude Van Damme of serious actors. Yes, although I mean I love Liam Neeson and I do think he's a serious actor, but obviously. But another guy where you're like, could you imagine him trying to put a Mario accent on top of his Neeson voice? He did a great job <laughs> in me, um Mario. Uh uh Lego movie. Oh, he does do a voice in Oh, that's right, yeah. When he's good cop, he sounds very different in a way that I was pretty astonished he had actually, like, the range to do. Yeah. If it Um, wasn't animated, would it be more distracting? Probably. Maybe. Yeah. I I would like to watch the footage of him at the mic in the falsetto going, Hi, buddy. (laughs) It Uh, must look so weird coming out of him. Obviously, Driver's done a southern accent. Right, like Logan Lucky, you know, sure. like he's done that. But and even uh, those, he goes a little lighter. Like, he usually makes the sort of, as you said, House of Gucci choice of, like, I'm just going to put a, a slight layer. What did he pick in Last Duel? Another everybody do what they want. I think he just did Off the Rack Adam Driver. Am doing, I wrong about that? He's just I doing Off so, the yeah. Rack Drives. Yeah. yeah, this is the Last Duel. I think he just does that. <laughs> I'm going to duel you. Hannah, Hannah, I'm going to duel you, Hannah. Annette, he's American. Yeah. Yes. You're my baby, Annette. I'm going to make my baby sing. My I, baby, Annette. I ha- you like Annette, right, Bill? I love it. It was my should. number one movie of that year. I like Annette. I like Annette. That movie I sits like with Annette. me very well. Yeah. It's really, really I great. think he rules in Annette. Oh, yeah. Um, I feel like I just need to get this out of the way right now. I really struggled with this performance. In Ferrari? Yeah. Really? Oh, I love this performance. I really struggled with it in a way I was quite surprised by, and I'm like, I'm almost annoyed with myself for not being able to get past it, but it was a completely, it was not an intellectual thing at all. Mm. I just, like, could not, uh, and I, I, look, let's, let's unpack everything. This is Blank Check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. It's a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion products they want. Sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce. Baby, Mm. several years ago now, we did a series on the films of Michael Mann called The Cast of the Podhegans. Correct. A.K.A. Michael (laughs) Mansplaining. Yep. Uh, And we, we had on, as a guest... The great Bill Gabiri. True. Uh, who's something of a Michael Mann scholar. In fact, our final guest on the show, I believe. We, to he end, was, to he cap was here it for off. Black Hat, right, yes. And then yeah. here's his first movie in seven years, eight years? Uh, Black Hat was... Black 2015. 15, right? so right. eight years. Yes. Yep. Obviously, yeah. he did a TV pilot. In between, did he do anything Does else? Does luck happen pre or post pre. Black Pre. Wow. That's like 2013. Luck is pre, yeah. yeah. Because... Uh, in 2016, Ferrari is actually announced as right. his next movie starring Christian Bale. Yes. And then at some point it becomes a Hugh Jackman project. Yes. And then uh, it vanishes. This is what I want to dig into a lot. But uh, uh, Bill, we had you on for that. We had you on for uh, uh, Dunkirk. True. We had you on for Lorenzo's Oil, which is one of your favorite Lorenzo's movies of the night. Lorenzo's Oil. Yeah. But I feel like Nolan and Mann are like two of your titan guys that I think I always look to you. I'm always excited to read your writing on either of those guys and their work and your reviews and their interviews and all that. Um, and then we see Ferrari's finally coming out. Uh, oh, perfect opportunity to have Bill on again. Uh, I run into you. Uh, Marie and I run into you at a screening of uh, Oppenheimer and we're talking to you. And you were like, I should do the podcast again. And we were like, yeah, you should. How long has it been? Like six months? <laughs> and you were like, no, I was the last. The pandemic happened. <laughs> you right. were the last in-person record. You were the last yeah. time we ever went into the audio boom offices wow. to do the Lorenzo's Oil episode. It's been far too long. But the great Bill Gabiri is here. Hi. Talk about Ferrari, Hello. a movie you said you have seen six times. And you <laughs> walked in. Okay. Uh, he walked in, David. He walked in and he said, I'm actually sorry. I meant to re- watch it again last night and I didn't get the chance. And I said, how many times have you seen it? He said, six. Bilgo was apologizing for not watching it a seventh time. And I said, well, how <laughs> recently was the last time you watched it? And he went, last week. So, Bilga, I've called you out for this. You, uh, you often will do this. Well, you'll be like, I watched that movie three times. I still just don't like it. I'm like, how are you watching it three times, Bilga? You watch all these movies so many times I don't know how. They're like pieces of music, you know? Hell you yeah. got to go back to them. Hell it's, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, 
I it's a scheduling thing only for me. But yeah. when because it's one thing Ferrari you seeing over and over again, not too surprising to me. But like, what's a movie you didn't like this year that you kept trying to crack? I feel like we talk about this sometimes. This year. Like where you're like, I just, you well, know. I, I just watched Leave the World Behind twice. Yeah, you, well, that's and, actually and, and a it is sign of deep the insanity. worst movie I've seen this <laughs> right. year. I'm you sorry, hated I should, that. Yeah, I hated right. it. And yet you watched it but again. I had to, watching I had to, that two times is equivalent to you watching Ferrari 80 times. <laughs> no, because I would still enjoy watching Ferrari 80 times. I'm just this saying in terms of the, the effort, the right. workload. Like, yeah. What's a movie you and I sort of disagreed on this year that you, I feel like often even with a movie that you are mixed on, but maybe mm. people are fine of or there's you will then be like well let me spin it a couple more times to see if it gets me huh so a movie i disliked and you liked you mean? Yeah, or, or because that, i know it doesn't you, have to be me but like maybe there was movie, general consensus you hated movie, silent night for example and i saw that yeah. three times but i liked silent night. you saw that three times yes. do you know how many times david saw it less than one <laughs> 0.23. Uh, God, no, more than that. But, but 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 in some of these cases, it's because I'm writing about the movies that I have to watch. I mean, like Ferrari, I was sure. You know, I, I mean, I did the review. The first time I saw Ferrari, it was not entirely finished, so I had to right. kind of watch it again. Oh, again, of right. course, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then Ferrari. and then the third time I saw it was I'm sorry. We, we, I could spend all day talking about please, the different please, circumstances. Once again, this is why you were here. <laughs> the third time I saw it, it was actually I was I was at the Venice Film Festival, and I had just because of the the dumb uh, ferries that you have to take to get to the festival uh, venues, I had just missed a screening of Poor Things by like okay. 15 minutes. Right, and it was morning on the Lido, and I was just sitting there like nothing to do, nowhere to go, uh, and and I saw that. There was a screening of Ferrari starting in like 10 minutes. I was like, fuck it. I'm going to go see the Ferrari again. And then um, I got this call a few days later because I was supposed to interview Michael Mann in Modena um, while I was there uh, at, at, at Venice. And I got a call from his people saying, Michael is screening the film tonight in Modena. Right. I remember um, this. Right. This right. was this Which was is, an of course, adventure. where the film is set and yeah, where Ferrari's uh, right. factory he, was. Yeah, he's like yeah. screening it for the Ferrari factory workers right. and like the Everyone people. Everyone gets worked a jug of there. balsamic vinegar on I, their way I out. Wish, yeah, well, wasn't I the wish. screening the first half of the movie screened at one woman's house and then you had to drive across town and the second half of the movie was screened at a different woman's house? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, oh, oh, oh. I think a that's, a good, that's a good catch. Yes, that's yes, a good catch. That, that, sorry, sorry. That, that briefly just sounded like some was, Venice Film Festival shit. So, suddenly I was like, where is he going with this? I think <laughs> that joke is going to linger. Uh -huh. yeah, that joke will, people will initially be like, oh, the accent didn't land for me, but then they'll be right. like, yeah. This, yeah. this, this is, is the part of the podcast where, where I get daggers stared at me by my wife. <laughs> it's like, who are these women? <laughs> Whose homes are seeing Ferrari? She's holding and... a gun at you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so right. So you saw it in Modena and then you, and you walked around Modena with uh, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Man later on, right? Yes, yeah, so we can talk about that. That's great. Um, uh, and did you see it in New York? I did see it in New York. And, and I saw it in New York because I, I just wanted to see it again and then I and then I wanted to see it again, again. So, <laughs> so did you see it commercially ever? Like, did you go to a theater? No, it's not out yet. We're no, it's not, not out yet. Yeah, at no, the time so, we're recording um, this, it's not out yet. Yeah, I mean, no, they were all screening rooms except for the one in Modena, which was in like a big multiplex, and that was, I think, the biggest screen I've seen it on. Um, yeah, it was a great theater, by the way. Modena has nicer theaters than New Haven. Well, <laughs> no, New Haven called out. Uh, never been to Modena. Would love to go. Um, I saw this film at the Dolby 88, a totally nice screen with very yes. good sound, yes. which is crucial. And uh, there were like four of us in there. It was an early screening because I was going to interview man. And um, uh, about 20 minutes in, a guy started vaping, which oh, I've never seen wow. at a press screening. Yeah. Have I told this story? I don't think so. And then about 20 minutes later, he started taking pictures of the screen. Hmm. Cool. And I had this thought of like, well, because it was such aberrant behavior of like, I guess he's do was asked to do that by the studio, maybe. Like I was just sure. kind of like, why would he be doing this? Then he started filming the screen and Manola Dar just ran over to him and said, What are you doing? Oh, yes. And he I, put his phone away. Yeah. She said, Owen, Owen, stop doing that. I didn't say Fun that. Uh, Five no, it was not Owen. It was a rando, and it was crazy. But uh, it didn't didn't really disturb my viewing of the film. But it sure. was odd. Yeah. Uh, and then I saw it again uh, recently, just to refresh, because it's been a while. Yeah. So I saw this movie uh, at this time of year, especially when we're trying to get these end of the year new release movies uh, done and get the episodes banked up. I, I mostly find ways to weasel my way into guild screenings and award season guild. screenings. And yeah. 
Um, the weasel? So I'm seeing these movies in these sort of like ostracher push mm -hmm. frameworks where the movies are being hard sold and, you know, whatever. So I saw this with a, a man, driver, Woodley Q&A. The, the three the three amigos, the three stooges. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Man driver and Woodley. Um three taciturn folk, I will say. Woodley probably the most talkative of those three. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Um it was just a, an hour of all three of them saying pass to every question. Um, um no, it was like a a good QA, but you know, sometimes it's like you get um and, and festivals can be the same thing where you're like is there a sort of halo effect bump I'm getting of this movie being presented to me in the best environment possible with the context provided around it, with the filmmakers allowing to, like, put their own framework around it? Yeah. And other times, it's the worst feeling in the world to watch someone do a Q&A for a movie that you're like, I fucking hated this. This is like watching someone try to do a victory lap for a failure or whatever. Right. I do not dislike this movie. Okay. I would say uh, I, I put it towards the bottom of my man rankings, but I also like every movie he's made, including The Keep, which is obviously a fundamentally broken movie, but that I have a lot of love for. Um, but he is a guy that I have fairly high standards I mean, I for. I love a lot of his movies. I Yeah, I'm not sure where I would put this. I don't know where you like put Black this. But like Blackhead, a movie that all three of us are smart, clever, big boys about and understood was brilliant <laughs> from the beginning. And now other people have joined our island. That's a movie where I was like, day one, this rules. Mm. People are dumb, right? And so I know this movie's been like not dramatically divisive. I don't think anyone is laughing at this at the way that people were at Black Hat mm -hmm. upon first release. But I think there's been some variance of like, Bilga, you like wrote this review. I was like, holy fucking shit, here we go. Bilga's take on Ferrari is what I want. He's describing exactly the movie I want to see. And then I sat there and watched it and I felt a little <laughs> bit like, I wish I was watching the movie that Bilga described. Fucking Bilga lied to me. <laughs> And not, not that you lied to me. I'm just like, I believe everything you're describing. And that's the relationship, the experience I wanted to have. Mm -hmm. And then I bring up the Q&A thing only because then man who seemingly has the, the, no man's brain has a greater capacity for information where you're just like the fucking stats this guy rattles off for any question where you're like, he's retained every piece of trivia yeah, he he's really ever does. read he really, yeah. on every subject. Right. If you bring up an older movie, he immediately will launch into that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So as you said, like those three are a little bit taciturn in general for a Q&A like that. But people were asking him the right questions. Yeah. And he was giving you like Michael Mann 15 minutes explaining the history of Moderna or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, fuck, this is also the movie I want to see. Like man talking about the movie was gripping me in the way that reading your review gripped me, and watching it, I was like, I like this. But it was not totally... I, I wonder... Oh, so finish. No, you I talk, just, though. you know... You talk. You no, talk, No, but please. I was going to say, I, I, I wonder if sometimes that kind of anticipation works against it, too, because, because we were talking about movies that I don't like that I've seen multiple times. Yes. There are some films that, that I didn't like initially or was somewhat underwhelmed by initially based on my anticipation of them and then over the years i just kept returning to them and now now at my it, the age of innocence well. is is one of yeah. the, the classic one for me where i mean it was like one of the great disappointments of my life because it was like like one of my favorite novels you know my favorite directors my three favorite actors working at that time mm. you know and i I'd, I'd heard that before he screened before, before he made the film scorsese screened like the leopard and barry linden for oh, his yeah. for his um for his, uh, you know, for his cast for, and crew, my two of my three favorite movies, and um, and so I went into Age of Innocence just like, yeah, like let's fucking go, you know. And then I was like, oh god, no, what, why, you know? And and over the years, I would come back to it because there were so many beautiful things about it. The like, score is great, or you know the. And its reputation design. has only improved yes. since it came out. Yeah, when it a lot came of people out, felt it was that way. Seen is time. quite disappointing. Yeah, yeah. people forget this. And, and now I, I I still have a couple of issues with the film, but I I, I really love that film yeah, now. And whenever it screens movie. theatrically anywhere, I, I try to see it. I know? don't think I like I I don't think I overhyped myself, and I didn't feel that level of disappointment. Mm. But there's sometimes certain types of movies where I can read both the best and worst reviews and be like, this sounds like my shit. Right. The things people are criticizing this movie for sound like I'd be into it, and the things people are praising the movie for sound like I'd be into it. And so I just went in with a pretty settled, 
I'm probably going to connect to this. Yeah. For a movie that it feels like the response has been a little more, there's, I, I don't know if I'm reading anyone. Pretty muted. To this that's movie. what I was going to say. Yeah. Pretty muted. Huh. And a lot of don't people. Don't you think? I feel like people generally like it. I think I've read. Like not love though. Yeah. I, mean, I think it, some I th- some people love it, and I mean it's it like made the AFI top ten list. It did and you know, the MBR, which is and the MBR, yeah, yeah. 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 I it mean, did. so it's it's getting acclaim. Um, yeah. It is. I am curious to see what happens. I guess at that point, this podcast will have come out already. But yeah. I am curious to see what happens when it actually comes out in theaters. I I was just considering this. Look, look, I really like this movie, but I also. Um, I was not underwhelmed by it exactly, but I did. I did not walk out being like that movie is really going to appeal to everybody. <laughs> no, sure. I walked out being like that is, you know, a movie called Ferrari. That yes, it's about racing and uh-huh. it's about masculinity and it's about like the things that compel us to do to drive a car fast, which is 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 a fundamentally silly thing to do or crazy death defying thing to do, but also. A lot of people are going to walk out being like, "Why well, was it about like a fifty-something guy's marriage?" No. Like it, right? Like Look, you know, also which, not not to flatten I'm discourse. Not, no, no, I know not to flatten discourse in this way, right? But like the last in the gap since Black Hat, I think there has been a growing appreciation for the like Michael Mann, just feel it, pure vibes. Right. Don't get caught up in the logic. Right, but this the is mo- not that. No, so this like is movies, like the insider. The movies know? like Miami Vice and Black Hat that were like pretty mocked when they came out, seen as financial disasters. This doesn't make sense. This is illogical. These performances are silly. Whatever it is, there's there's really been a contextualization of them and a reclamation of them in a broader sense, and almost like a theology built around them. Right. And so there's a moment where you're like. Culture might be ready for the new Michael Mann movie, ready to receive it more warmly than the last couple, and then he's not doing that, as you're saying. Right, because it, the, the, and there's also the sense of kind of modernity and always kind of forward-looking quality to those films. I mean, they're about right, technology. Right. They're, they're suffused with technology. And, and this one is, this one is not. I mean, no. this one is almost quaint in that sense. I mean, that's, I actually love the fact that he did not make anything remotely like the film I thought it was going to be. Me too. I, see, yeah. this is the thing. I do too. Right, this is one right. of those movies where I'm like, in talking about it, it's almost going to be impossible for me to identify anything I found underwhelming about it. Because just on a textual level, not even like what the movie is doing textual, but describing the way in which it's mm-hmm. doing it, in the same way that when I read your review, I'm like, yeah, that sounds like something I would love. Yeah. Now, did w- when you saw a man um, talk... Did kept he, his winter jacket on the entire time, by the way. A big, puffy That's where all jacket. the information is stored, actually. Um, <laughs> his little note cards. He does actually, when I, a, couple of time, a couple of times when I've interviewed him, he, he sometimes will have like a little notebook with him. Really? Full of okay. scribbles. He never, he never looks at it. Yeah. But, but I remember when we did the, the BAM Q&A many years ago, 2016, um, he, was, he was looking through it beforehand. And I was like, oh, what are you looking at? He's like, yeah, just, just trying to remember the, all the proper names. It's just And astounding. then, of course, and then he, he's just on and right. doesn't yeah. forget a thing. A thing. Yeah. A thing. And it's like he can, you, you can ask him any sub-question and it'll branch out into a fully developed tree. Yeah. Yeah. There's and, nothing you can catch him off guard, it feels like. He does have like kind of these, they're not canned answers, but they're sort of answers that, that, that he often gives, but they're like good answers. That's right. the thing. It's and like, they're paragraphs long. They're paragraphs long and they make perfect sense and they're really insightful. Yeah. The, the other thing I was going to say about, no, sorry, the reason I was asking about um, his Q&A, because yeah. c- the thing he told me when I interviewed him that I, that I found fascinating and, and I, I, I saved some of that from my interview for another piece I'm going to write, but... Um, he was really obsessed about the fact that the film is like fundamentally unresolved, like this conflict yeah. or the, the conflicts in the film are fundamentally unresolved. And that was one of the things that really attracted him to it. Yeah. So there's, and, and, and that's something that, cause I love the film the first time I saw it, but there was something about it that I remember feeling like, this is great. I love this but it sort of ends in a very strange way, in a very understated, muted, weird way. Mm-hmm. And then I will say one of the nice, I mean, this is one of the things I love about rewatching movies, mm-hmm. certain movies, is every time I see one of these films, I mean, Barry Lyndon is like this, Days of Heaven is like this, Thin Red Line is like this, 
The Conformist is like this. Yeah, Oppenheimer is like this. Movies, sure. But, but like, but like every time I watch it, I notice something else about it that moves me. Like, like the sure. point in the movie when I cry is different each time I watch it. In this these, movie specifically, you're in, saying in, in these movie types too, of films. In these, in these types of films and in this movie too. Can like, I ask the moments that have made you cry across the six times you've watched this film? <laughs> well, the first time I saw it, I didn't know anything about the Mila Milia race. and that, did the, I. The, the, like the also, but they shouldn't have done that, in my opinion. The race? Yeah, they yeah. shouldn't yeah. have been doing that. No. Racing that is bad. I, th in, I, th yes. I think I think the where the Jordan message Hoffman of, after he saw Gran Turismo, where he started texting <laughs> oh, all yes, of us, being right, like, yeah. "What the fuck is this?" And we were like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "They drive the cars around, like, <laughs> and they might kill someone." I, I ran and, into. Like, were you not aware of racing? And I had, yeah. and I had just seen Ferrari, right. and I remember Jordan like talking <laughs> like, about. You it. think that's he killed bad, a Jordan. guy? Yeah. He killed a guy. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this wait till you see half a fucking, fucking Ferrari. Town. After the screening, I ran into an old family friend who I had not seen in maybe 15 years, and we just talked about that for 20 minutes. There was like two seconds of like how are you doing what are you up to this is, why would anyone fucking do this <laughs> a thousand miles and we were almost in Italy. hushed tones where we were like I just kind of can't get past how insane sure. this is so you didn't know about the Mille Miglia which is the big race in this yeah, film yeah. in 1950 I mean I knew I knew about the last I knew one. that there was such a race I did not realize that that race had ended in 1957 right. after what happened right. this, during this movie I saw a uh, review say it is one of the most horrific things I have seen depicted in a film in decades and I'm like that is not hyperbolic no yeah, when yeah. this yeah. thing happens and we're a Assuming that everyone who listens to this episode has either seen the movie or is willing to have it ruined because it will is be in wide release that they, they're, they've been talking about it candidly for months, which yeah. is sort of interesting. Like, yeah. man was candid about it in the first article about this movie. Of like, yeah, we depict the Mille yeah. Mille disaster. And, right. Yes. The incident itself is truly horrific. Right. And I think the film depicts it so incredibly and viscerally oh, yeah. in a way that is not exploitative, but is like kind of jaw-dropping in... The horror of it. Have you seen that there's um, archival footage of the 19, I believe it's the 1955 Le Mans race. Okay. Um, when something like that happened, although yeah. it was Huge Le Mans. disaster. It was like 83 <sighs> people died and, and, it, and, and yeah. you see it. It's a shot. I mean, it yeah. happens a lot faster because in real life it happens. I mean, it's actually kind of slowed down in Ferrari, but um, it's the scariest thing yeah. you've ever seen. I mean, it's it's horrible. Right. It's and horrible. It just 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 slices through this that's crowd. The thing. Of You're like, if if Michael Mann showed this happening at real speed, it would be like a jump scare where someone's face just transforms. Yeah. Right? Where you're like, your eyes wouldn't even be able to process how quickly yeah, yeah. that amount of carnage. But sorry, I cut you off. You were saying uh he was talking about Oh, no, but the but the thing was that um, well, well, you had asked me what um, what scenes in oh, the yes, movie make yes, me cry. Well, the first time I saw it, because I hadn't, I, because I I didn't know this, that scene just absolutely wrecked me. It's devastating. Um, and and then of course the the scene early on when he visits his son's grave. Mm -hmm. um, and then different times, different other things have like really moved me. And and the thing that really moves me now is, I mean, that final moment. Um, when, with the son? No, right before that, when when she declares to him her wish that he not recognize Piero uh, with the name Ferrari right. as right. long right. as she's alive. The the first time I saw the film, I remember thinking, "Huh, that's kind of a like kind of a dick move of her." Right. Um, and and but then I when I saw it again, I I realized, you know, this woman is is imprisoned by her grief. And for her, that scene early on uh, when when they both visit the tomb separately and drivers like talking to or Enzo is talking to you his know son. his, his son, his dead son. son. Yes. Um and you know, he talks about how he sees him in his dreams and 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 that's like the one face he does want to see because everyone else he sees in his dreams are people who died racing his cars. Mm -hmm. Um but after he leaves because he's crying. And then after he leaves, Penelope Cruz, uh, Laura comes in and she has this like long close up where she's like, it's like she's looking at Dino and smiling. And you realize for her, even though he's gone, he's, he's, he's still there. Some essence of him in her mind is still there. And part of that is the fact that she's never processed her grief. And she, she essentially lives with the ghost of Dino. And if Piero is recognized 
as a Ferrari. It's sort of diminishes. Dino. Yeah, it's right. like That's it's like Dino end. finally goes away. Right. And when I think about about that, I just like I'm actually ha- getting emotional now thinking about it. And so when she says, "It is my wish that you do not recognize the boy with the name Ferrari," um, it's not done spitefully. It kills me. It yeah. kills me. Um, I, I, I mean, we're ping ponging all around in conversation right, sure. here, but I think we just need to acknowledge Penelope Cruz is like colossal in this thing it is it is an unbelievable she's so good and she is someone i have a a, a tremendous amount of respect and adulation for Mm -hmm. uh but i was just like not prepared for uh it is one of those performances that someone comes on screen and immediately is tapping into like a well of emotion in an unshowy way that is in an unshowy way yes yeah i mean she it's a showy performance in that she's Got it all over her face. Yeah. But this isn't like Vicky Christina Barcelona. She's not, She's not like screaming. It, no. But you're right. just like, oh my yeah. God, she is in dialogue with something that feels so honest and so profound. And it is in every inch of her body. Oh, and yeah. she is maintaining that for the entire film. Yeah, there's this there's this other moment that I, I only noticed upon subsequent viewings. So early on when we see Ferrari in that 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 first scene when he's when he's, you know, creeping out of bed, um, and we see, you know, he looks in at Piero sleeping, and we see in the background like the little toy cars. Right. Um, and then later on, when Penelope Cruz or when Laura uh, visits the house and it's empty, and she sees that car on the stoop, the toy car, and she looks at it, and suddenly we see that this car is actually really old. And oh, she, and, sure. and she realizes, or we realize, that was Dino's. That was car. Dino's, and he gave it to the new son. And, and he gave it to the new son. Yeah. And also, that's how she realizes. There's a boy in this house. Yeah. Um, and the expression on her face, again, destroys me. No dialogue. There's no dialogue in the scene. And she's incredible. That's something you get out of a rewatch. I mean, yeah. Just to be clear, to just set up for anyone mm-hmm. who maybe didn't see the film. <laughs> this film's called Ferrari. It's about Enzo Ferrari, the creator of Ferrari. <laughs> As Bilga says, it's announced in 2016. This is a long gestating passion project. Sure. I mean, we can do that. Yeah, we can do sort of the development of this movie, yeah, which is back up and, bizarre yeah. in a way. It's announced in 2016, but it is a movie he's been trying to make for 20 plus years. Right. Like it's, it's, it's 90s. Right. Yeah, he's been yeah, cooking yeah. since the 90s. Yeah. Um, and and I, as he put it in the Q&A, you know, he's not generally interested in womb to tomb biopics and even Ali, which covers the greatest span of life, still... Put it's still the middle it. chunk. It's not right, really. Right. Yeah. And it's yeah. more of an essay film, even though it's covering a wider span. But he said when he found out that Ferrari, and I'm sure he said similar things to you and said it in a bunch of other places, but at the Q&A, he said, like, when I found out that basically, like, these three different things all came to a head within a week of his life, yeah. it was kind of too dramatically perfect right. that you could zoom in on this one moment. Essentially, his business being in total crisis. Yeah. His marriage, I suppose, already dissolved, but, like, his marriage entering a new Coming phase to a of crisis, right. right? And the Mila Milia, which was this insane race that he was he needed to win for his business and his marriage, but also ended in the biggest disaster in the history of Italian racing or whatever. Right. right? You know, like, this horrible cataclysm. That, like, all the contradictions within this guy came to a head within such a short span of time, and then as you said, didn't resolve themselves. That's the yeah. thing. I feel like the problem was when he's going to studios being like, hey, can I have $100 million? <laughs> um, Ferrari's in his 50s. Uh, he's going to drink espresso and yell at people. Lots of people die. Yes, he wins the race, but under a total cloud of death. <laughs> yeah, and there's no ending. <laughs> and there's not <laughs> much of an ending, ending yeah. except for he shows his son, you know, a nice place. Yeah. And I just assume studios were throwing up their hands being like, can't this be about like fucking winning Formula One races or something? Like, what's going yeah. on with you? Or about a guy who started out young and a racer and then became a success. Yeah. And along the way, he's attached to Ford versus Ferrari too, is. which is which is funny. Because I don't know if, I, I didn't ask him this, but I, I don't know if like when he was making Ford versus Ferrari, that was his way of like sort of channeling get, yeah. that interest into right, a maybe different I movie. Can, Right, get but but of course Ferrari. It's like Nolan a, working Howard Hughes into Dark Knight Rises, where right, it's like right. I did all this work that I need to put somewhere. Right. Or, or Barry Lyndon, like yeah, Kubrick yes. basically like basically says, Doing okay, I have all the Napoleon, Napoleon stuff. Right, right. Let's do this movie. Yeah. yeah, but like Ferrari, 
uh, both Enzo and the company are barely a character. In Ford. That's a Ford movie. Like that yes. movie is about Ford. But, but Man's version had a lot more Ferrari in it. Makes sense. Like I mean, he that's he actually not surprising. Yeah. I mean he had he had a whole thing about the the palace intrigue around Ferrari and his his technicians and so I mean it, it, we went on a whole tangent about this when I interviewed him and 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 then finally he said. I think it was probably a good decision to cut all that stuff out. <laughs> did, did Man end up with a producer credit on He Ford? has a yes, producer he has credit. Exactly. He got an Oscar nomination. Yeah, that's right. Because he's got, like, his few, his surprisingly few Oscar nominations in his career, two of them are for producing The Aviator and producing Ford v. Ferrari movies he then gave up. Right, movies he essentially was beaten out of making. He did not get an Oscar nom for okay. Ford v. Ferrari, but he is a producer on it. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe an executive He was an executive producer. producer. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, right, yeah. But, I mean, The Aviator, he was he was with The Aviator all the oh, way. Right. He, um, he had more. Of, yeah. But he could have made that a movie, right? He could have made a Howard oh, yeah. Hughes movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we um, I interviewed him about it. Actually, this is a piece I still haven't written, but I, I, I talked Duke to, also I has talked like to eight Michael incredible Mann. pieces I, that no one's yeah. seen. I talked to Michael Mann for like an hour about The Aviator, uh, which will one day hopefully be a piece. David. Yeah. Do me a favor. Yeah. Picture that thing you've always wanted to learn. Okay. Name it. What is it? The Art of Love. Okay. Now picture. I bet you they have one. Learning honestly. it. From the person who's literally the best at it in the world. I bet you Masterclass actually does have, like, X on the art of love. Yes. Right? Let's Let, find let's out. Let's look it up. Because that's what you get with Masterclass. You get the best in the world teaching you how to become the best. And this year, 2024, you can learn from the best to become your best with Masterclass. Don't just talk about improving. Masterclass actually helps you do it. They offer over 180 world-class instructors. So whether you want to master negotiation with Chris Voss, mm -hmm. think like a boss with Martha Stewart. I mean, these are all going to help you in the art of love. Of course. Uh, we talked about many film-related classes they have uh, on their site. Look, they've got Emily Morse, the host of the podcast Sex with Emily. Okay. Sex and communication. That's okay. sort of in the art of love sure. realm, uh -huh. right? Okay, so maybe I'd go to her, or maybe I would go to RuPaul, self-expression and authenticity. Very crucial. Sure. They've got a lot in the lifestyle section. you got David section. Lynch on filmmaking creativity. you got Helen Mirren and Samuel Jackson on acting. Yeah, you're sort of swerving us back to what our podcast topic is. trying to be a little more are, relevant, but I also like sense. opening up the column of the love conversation. Look, I, the thing about Masterclass that's kind of fun is you start clicking on some of those verticals, you'll be surprised what you find. There's some cool stuff down Here's there. the other thing. With Masterclass, you get unlimited access to intimate one-on-one -on -one classes with the world's best, so you don't need to limit yourself to one or two lessons. You can, no. you can venture, explore around, okay? Christina They're, Aguilera on singing? Well, that's a thing I don't know how to do. Well, she can teach you her, her unique vocal techniques in over three point hours of voice lessons. Anna Wintour, creativity and leadership. Ben. Guys, I could learn some shit from Anna Wintour. You could You're gonna learn have to wear lot. sunglasses indoors. Yeah. You're like, wait a second. I could do that. I could definitely up, do that. All right, look. They've got over 180 world-class instructors, like you said, okay? Mm -hmm. It's unlimited access to intimate one-on-one -on -one classes with the world's best. I've learned so much from watching master classes on, on things that I never even thought. Such as? What are some of your faves? You're was, a big fan. I'm a big fan. I always talk about the Helen Mirren one where she talks about how uh, her starts with her walking across the stage and sitting in a chair and saying that's the most difficult thing you can do as an actor. And then she unpacks that. It's cool. Yeah. What can I tell you, though, that might really get you excited, Griffin, here in 2024? I hate having to pay 100%. Of advertised well, price for anything. That's the thing I hate. I would love a class teaching me how to save 15%. For one, I just want to point out that every new membership comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Well, that's pretty so dangerous. you do have no risk there. Okay, I hate risk. But right now, our listeners will get an additional 15% off of an annual membership at masterclass.com slash check. Get 15% off right now at masterclass.com slash check, masterclass.com slash check. This feels like a masterclass right now. You are teaching me how to save 15% on masterclass. Ben just sent Tony Hawk teaches skateboarding. Which okay, well, that sounds cool. Is pretty cool. There's a barbecue one I watched that was really good. That sounds actually pretty useful. You how actually like doing or barbecue. Eat it. I'm a grill boy. What would you say there, Ben? Cook, cook or it. eat. Look up the guy who does the barbecue. He's, he's some kind of renowned pit master. Yeah. Something probably I've never like the done. Franklin probably guy. Yep, will Aaron never Franklin. do, but I watch it and I'm just like, it is fascinating to watch someone who knows this much about their chosen field. I could see you become a grill master. Really? Yeah, dude. Okay. It's one of those forms of cooking that I think is intuitive. I would agree with that. It's a little 
Yeah, it is intuitive. That's a good way here's to put it. Here's what I it. think it's, is it's patience. Here's what the thing. It's easy. No. <laughs> yeah, here's what's easier. Easy Mac. Wait a second. This the most video, intuitive step one, of... buy an iconic Texas restaurant. He's he's not even trying. I'm joking. <laughs> no, he teaches you how to like smoke a pork butt. Yeah. He teaches you how to smoke ribs. Qualities of different types wood. of wood. It's it's cool. It's he cool gets stuff. you grilling broccolini at a certain oh, point. Come on. It's pretty fun. Masterclass.com slash check. I mean, we did it. 15% off. That's right. I. So I also interviewed Michael Mann. I didn't do as good a job as Bill. We'll see. I doubt this. Right after this, I'm going to start sifting through my. Uh, it was two months ago that Next I did. I'm going to find out that Ben interviewed Michael Mann. <laughs> <laughs> and like, he's, he's on a, a sleep, actually, sleep, sleep time Michael Mann is here podcast. in the room. <laughs> that would be incredible. But he won't talk to me. You know him at this point, I think, enough that you have probably, you know, an easier sort of, you know, I'm terrified to meet this man. He's a man who's very important to me. He's uh, famously chill. I was afraid he'd be scary. You were sort of like, he's not scary. He's not scary. Does he like love small a talk? nice guy? <laughs> he was really pleasant. He was like a very, he's affable. Well, the, the other thing I told you, I think, I think I told you this, but like he's particularly affable and, and, and easygoing right now. I think he's really right. happy and relieved mm. to have made this movie. Yes. Like I, mean, I, like I first interviewed him around the time of Black Hat and he was fine. Like we had a perfectly nice conversation, but, but he, like he was, Tense, you know, sure, like, and, and right, and then obviously that movie didn't work out, and he feel like financially, and he feels bad about yeah, it. I think, yeah. it, uh, I, and if, then, and but then b between Black Hat and Ferrari, I feel like he then entered this weird phase of like everyone being like, "You're the best, man." We're right. talking about all your old movies. This is what I'm saying. There you became know, this yeah. real like, you know what? This guy's one of the living masters, and I'm sure all, he like, appreciates that. But he's also like, "Yeah, I'd like to also make some new shit it was before I go." Thing these guys know? get into this place very often, where they're like doing career retrospectives and being flown around the world to festivals, and like their old films are being revived, yeah. and they're getting like these standing ovations. And then it's like, why won't people give me money to make a new thing? I, I, yeah. I'm still here. I'm still active. I'm ready to go. Well, that's the thing. It's like I, I mean, I've interviewed him maybe a dozen times over the years. But it's all been between Black Hat and this movie. Mm -hmm. Sure. Like, in, during and it's that been period, for old movies. Yeah, usually. it's been like, right. you know, there's a re release of Ali coming up. You know, right. there's a, you know, there's heat been two. a heat an anniversary, right. you know, or Heat 2, or, or, uh, I mean, the you know, books that he's published, you know, the, the, yeah. I, I mean, that's the thing. He's like, you know, working. He's working. He's always working. I mean, that's the thing he, he would always say is, or like, you know, Insider had, had a screening at MoMA interview mm -hmm. for that. It's like, it's all the old stuff. Which is great, which I actually love. I actually prefer to talk to people about the old stuff than the new stuff, honestly. Well, because but, but, when you're talking about the new stuff, you can't get into, like, quote-unquote spoilers. You can't right. get into how people eventually felt about the movie because you don't know. You can't get into yeah. the cultural relationship. And, and, right. yeah. and they're, in, they're in promo mode, too. And they're so in yeah. promo mode, yeah. so they don't want to be as candid. Right. Um, Even and, off the record, they're not candid, you know, right. with the new stuff. Um, unless you're Martin McDonough, uh, <laughs> one of my favorite interviews I ever did. Uh, the only guy to ever just uh, yeah. physically hit stop on my record over oh, and over again and be like, great. let me say this thing. And I'd be like, all right, Martin. That's um, the dream. It is awesome when they do that. <laughs> um, but he's an older man. He had this giant binder filled with technical nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. He kept getting phone calls from his post house you know, who were working on, like, the Dolby print or whatever, and he would, like, talk to them in literally fucking binary code is what it said. You know, like, just suddenly he launches <laughs> into, you know, a highly, highly intense, you know, technical discussion of, like, well, the blacks are need to be this number or whatever. And then I would ask him about it, and he'd be, like, explaining it to me, and I would just, like, I d didn't know what he was talking about, you know, which is great. He is constantly in in that in that mode. When I, when I talked to him um, in Modena... Because I was, I was t telling him, oh, I, you know, because I, I'd just seen the film again the night before. I was like, oh, it was interesting seeing it with an Italian audience because they respond to different things. Or I also mm -hmm. mode in an audience because they they know much more about sure, the subject. Right, also, right. some of them work at Ferrari. And and his the, the first thing he said was, yeah, I, I don't like how uh, they're, you know, they're like reading the subtitles uh, when I want them to be looking at the actors' faces. So I've decided I'm going to dub the movie for Italian release. Wow. And wow. I was like, I mean, the, the Italians dub a lot of movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they dub movies. Right. But the ideal for a lot of filmmakers is that they be subtitled. And yeah. he was just like, no, I'm going to dub don't look, it. Don't look I, at I, my I, words. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So I don't know. So this script is credited to Troy Kennedy Martin, who is, God bless him, not alive. Yes. And not only is he not alive, he died in 2009. Yeah. So it's an old script. He's like the guy who wrote the Italian job. Like, yep. that's what I know him as. Yeah. He's sort of a well-known guy, I guess. He's sort of like a... He did some TV, right. too. Like I mean, a solid he, screenwriter. But but not a ton of credits. No. he Red Heat? Yeah. 
Um, Belushi Schwarzenegger? Yeah. Um, But, uh, so I guess this script probably existed in some form in the 90s. I don't know who, if anyone, he was thinking about in the 90s. Like, I I don't know. It's only in 2016 when it's Bale as Ferrari is the first actor announced, Which right? Which makes sense. Of you course. know, they've worked together, but in a supporting role, it makes sense. Bale feels like a perfect Michael Mann lead. Yeah. In, an insane person. Yes. Is that what you mean? An yes. insane, obsessive person. I mean, Bale's not insane, but he's a hardworking, intense dude. And I think that's why he winds up not doing the movie, because he's like, oh, I would have to gain, like, 50 pounds for right. it, or 100 he pounds. He can't or, help but right. gain 50 pounds meanwhile, and Adam remove Driver's his voice like, box yeah. and replace it with an right. Italian voice right. box. Meanwhile, Adam Driver's just like, give me the fat suit. Give me a fucking <laughs> pillow and yeah. I'll, yeah, you know, just sort of go like this. But there's a lot of that with Bale where they're like, right, parts that you hear he's flirting with for a long time and then he goes like, I couldn't crack it. And everyone's like, just do what you're doing right now. And he's like, no, I failed. I'm walking away. Right. I couldn't get the look. I couldn't get the voice. I couldn't transform myself in the way I wanted to. What's he? I, so I haven't seen Amsterdam. Is oh. he doing something in that? He's oh, doing a lot oh, of stuff. Oh, yeah. He's definitely doing something in Amsterdam. Because <laughs> you look at him and it's he's got facial hair or thing. whatever, but like it doesn't look like he's... Glass eye. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. It's, it's... Did he pluck out one of his eyes? Christian. Absolutely. He's like, all right, here <laughs> we go. Uh, he's got a glass eye. Okay. He's okay. doing... Is he doing an he's accent? He's doing a million things. He's doing yes. a million Oh, yeah. He <laughs> yeah. is doing an accent. I, he's doing kind of like a Brooklyn, uh, New York kind of... Yeah. 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 I also didn't see the movie where... Is he Edgar Allan Poe or no. No, Harry Melling is Edgar Allan Poe, yes. but he's helping him solve a crime or something? Yeah. 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 Did anyone see that movie? I saw, no. I, I saw that movie three times. No, that's impossible. Crazy. That's Andy impossible. That's impossible. Three times. People kind of liked it. I liked it. I, I feel like the reaction to that movie was muted. It was a mute. It was a Netflix release. So, yeah, well, so that, it doesn't that, exist. That really. hurts yeah. it. Right. Um, he did play a god killer in Thor Love and Thunder. Oh, sure. And he killed movie? gods himself with his own hand. <laughs> and he was Perfect. the only good thing in that movie. I too. still have not seen that movie. It's the only it's Marvel dreadful. movie I haven't seen. It's a dreadful, dreadful film. film. I agree good. with you. He is good. He's yeah. genuinely invested in doing something in it. But he's like kind of playing like the child catcher. Like I, it's a very over yeah. the top, fun, super serious film performance. And, and he gets that movie on a level that no one else involved with that film right. I think because yeah. because I mean because fair admission I, I I like Taika Waititi still even though he's made a number of films I don't like um, but all his films are about like these characters who are discovering that their entire system of belief right. is 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 Built bullshit on a lie or right. Sure. right right and yeah. that is the part that Christian Bale is playing in Thor Love and Thunder. Right. Nobody else seems to understand it, including the fucking director. <laughs> well, <laughs> the director right. who maybe like, understood it at some point, but then yeah. kind of forgot, yeah. I guess. It was, it was, but, you know, but it's like it why got drowned out by Kevin Feige Hunt or... for the Wilder People is great because yeah, right. Sam Neill understands how to both play the comedy of the movie and play what you're talking about honestly. Right. On, right. A, on a smaller scale. Yeah, yeah. And when it all just becomes silly, banana, goofy bullshit, you're just like, does anyone care? Why am I watching this? You know? Yeah. And, and as as in all things, Christian Bale turns out to be the one person on set who cared. Yeah. You know? Well, and then, you know, it is odd that Christian Bale ends up doing Ford v. Ferrari basically instead of this. Yeah. And he is very good in that I film. I think he's great, great. in that film. Uh, and, that, and I also really like that movie, but it's like great a movie. fun, rollicking dad movie yeah. that, like, takes you inside a story but not in some, like, hyper-emotional way. It's a good movie. It's a very good movie. I, I think mean, Mangled is not great at, like, Michael Mann-style deep operatic emotion. That no. movie makes me feel yeah. like it's not like it's nothing. But also what's interesting about that movie is that's textually what it's basically about, right? Yeah. That Mangold is the Matt Damon character. Right. And right. Christian Bale is more of a Michael Mann type. Mm-hmm. And Matt Damon's right. like, can we just, like get a movie that will make like one fifteen domestic can we just like I think, we yes. don't need to win oscars here like, we don't need to get the best reviews of our career is this something man talked about where he's like that guy killed himself and i would have yeah. made that explicit and the movie doesn't right yeah. the end christian bale dies we're sure. just spoiling every yeah. movie with ferrari in the title yeah. i guess right well, yeah absolutely think, was he the one he said talking that. about yeah, that yes, he right. said that and, and that's but i think that speaks to what you're talking about which is that it's like yes M- mangold is is matt damon and he's yeah. like listen Lose the race. It's fine. We'll be fine. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, yeah. and, and, Michael Mann, and, and right. Michael Mann is like in the you know driving the car, and he's like, "I'm gonna fucking kill myself." Right. You know, like, right. like, <laughs> like this is the this is the dynamic. Yeah, and I think like James Mangold thinks of himself as like 
one of the last high-level journeyman filmmakers, right? Where it's like, I'm serious-minded enough that I can elevate material in the studio system with good people and make it better than it has any excuse to be. But maybe I could never make something that is mm. like a deeply personal, expressive masterpiece. I, I, I will say I really like Mangold. He's made a couple like of Mangold. really great films. But he like, has made multiple films that I love. He's Strong made a few great. films I honestly don't like but that movie but, is so you know, much about being and then a lot like, of them sort of like mm. that, that's a yeah. movie to me about like all the executives i work with are dumb but i also understand that telling them all to go fuck themselves yeah doesn't help I, my movie i need to figure out which concessions to make yeah to still do something i can be proud of but christian bale's the guy who's just like fuck you it's all or nothing yeah no exactly and mangold i mean mangold if you look at his early career is the like he had a couple of false starts yeah and then, totally. and then, yeah. sort of, and then he makes heavy, and he makes Copland, and it looks like he's going to be this auteur, and then Copland doesn't quite do what it's, right. and then you know Harvey Weinstein. Copland fucks had it up. too much baggage. Right. Like it's Weinstein, it's like Ken Stallone. Be serious again. Like people were too, and it's a good movie. Yeah, like, yeah. it's a like very good movie. movie. Yeah. But, but 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 you're right though. I think there's a certain point at which, and I, I hate psychoanalyzing directors like that, but, yeah. but I guess it's part of the job. But it's um, also this podcast yeah. obsession. Yes. No, yeah. but like he. You know, at some point, I think he realizes there is a way that I can work within the system and yes. still make the kinds of movies I want. And then every once in a while, he maybe makes a movie he doesn't want. But but you know, maybe no, you're a movie right. About I mean, you're like right. night and day or whatever. Yeah. But uh, I mean, my thing, and I think Griffin agrees with me, is like I actually prefer his more uh, commercial, less serious comic book movie, The Wolverine, yes. to his hyper serious, like quite prestige comic book movie that got Oscar nominations, but, Logan. But Ford v. Ferrari almost feels Logan. like a movie about Logan where it's like, look, I played the game and the prize was I got to make Logan. <laughs> right. A movie that never should have been made in that style at that level and it was a huge hit and it got Oscar nominations. Yeah. But like it was all long-term strategy of like building up the goodwill where they were like, will you let me stretch Wolverine a little bit yeah. into a different zone? And people forget about Logan. You know, like we talk about, yeah. I mean, I mean we, we talk about like what a like kind of monumental film like Black Panther was right. because sure. of the Oscar nomination. Yeah. And people forget about Logan, you know. They do. It's because I guess the X-Men franchise well, yeah. is so weird. A, a, or, a, but a forgettable yes. franchise it that is. won't go away. But that's even for like compared <laughs> yes. to Black Panther, Logan is still the only superhero movie to get a screenplay nomination. I think right? so. Yeah. Uh, unless oh and let's count Incredibles. I don't. I don't count Incredibles. That's okay. not like based on a comic book. No. It's sort of based on a comic book, sure. but it's not actually. Okay. Bale drops out. Paramount then announces that they bought the rights. Or no, Paramount announces they bought the rights. Then Bale drops out. Mm -hmm. Then in 2017, Jackman is announced. Numi, Numi Rapace is, mm -hmm. is being considered for the, I assume, the Penelope Cruz role. Mm -hmm. But then Paramount drops out, I assume, over budget concerns and their general abandonment of all serious filmmaking uh -huh. at that yeah. time, like 2017 not, not a great time for Paramount. Like sort of post-Brad Gray. Yes. Jackman... Is an actor I love. Uh huh. I think you love him too. I, Speaking I, of Logan, when, obviously. when he is good, he is great. It's sort of hard for me to imagine him in this. Role. I can't imagine. I'd like when I, I kind of like to see it. I guess when, when I read that Jackman was involved, I was like, I, did I dream that? Because that doesn't seem like something that would actually happen. Like it feels like Man was like, I need a a star that appeals to European audiences, right? Yes. Because it's like this movie's whole strategy, I assume, is partly based on like, well, maybe we'll sell tickets in Europe, especially, right? Yeah. And I think Jackman in, makes sense for that. I think in Europe more than in the states, Jackman's a pretty sunny actor. You know, <laughs> he has more range than one. He does. I mean, I mean, again, Logan, the, the I mean, prestige, Logan, right? the prestige yeah, you know. is like, prestige, you know, yeah, he yeah. can do the sort of tortured spiral yeah. thing. Uh, or or even, you know, what have I done? Sweet Jesus, what have I done? <laughs> I'm thief in the night with my dog in the rod. I mean, I guess like Prisoners, but to me, I'm like, Prisoners is just not what I want from Jackman. He can do yeah, it. Yeah, but he's really good in that. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think in, in Europe more than here in the States, like, if a superhero actor does a bizarre uh, uh, artsy film, American audiences are like, yawn, get back to the good shit. Yeah. Right. And in Europe, like, if you're Wolverine once, 
your movies will basically make a bare minimum amount. Right. You can you can you can probably make a profit. At right. Least. If yes. you just get like it, it's you know you hear these stories and Ferrari seem to be one of these movies where it's like there's a list of eight guys and if you can get one of these eight guys you have your financing for Ferrari. Yeah. Right. And Bale makes perfect sense to be on that list and Jackman makes perfect sense to be on that list and then when as you're setting up it's like okay Jackman's attached Paramount's dropped it STX picks they it up they come in yes right right with Jackman still involved yes. right. And you're like, okay, shit, is this movie finally going to happen? And then the pandemic killed it, I yeah. believe, or at least killed Jackman. Being and then it. there's right. just this sort of like very sudden announcement. The movie's still happening. It's Adam Driver. It's starting right away. Right. And Penelope Cruz and Shalene Woodley, of all people, and it's STX. Yes. Which was still a going concern, I guess, is now mm -hmm. basically not. Has yeah. dissolved by the time the movie is now being released. Uh, which which yeah. which is great though because Neon winds up picking it up and yeah. they're, they're, they're such a better a more competent company. Right. That, yeah. Neon company. would never be able to greenlight this movie at right. this budget but they can release it better than STX ever could. Yeah, and give it the kind of love that it probably needs. Yeah. Which STX was never going to do. It, no. It is fascinating to me. I know he is Kylo Ren. Right? So like in a certain way it puts him on what we're talking about mm -hmm. the Batman Wolverine tier. Yeah. He's obviously 20 years younger than the character he's playing, significantly younger than Bale and Jackman, the two guys he's talked about. You talk he's a with generation him. below those guys. Yes. Yeah, not, not, you know, in a bad way. Right. And, like, outside of Star Wars and 65, which still is a little bit inexplicable, he has, like, <laughs> really stuck to, no, I'm, like, using my star power to get the movies off the ground that don't get made anymore. The auteur, the auteur's dream project. It is wild that he has become the one guy. Yeah. David and I have texted about this, but like he is like if in the seventies, De Niro took every part that Pacino, Hackman, Duvall, yeah. and Hoffman played. Like he absorbed them all. But beyond that, that he seems to be the one guy. If you're like a legendary director with a spotty commercial record who has a passion project he's never been able to get off the ground, you attach Driver and it finally happens. Ferrari happens. Megalopolis happens. Fucking Don Quixote happens. This guy can will the movies that no one else can get yeah. made. When, like, for years you're like, he, he had this A-lister attached and they couldn't get the funding. He had this guy. He had Tom Cruise at his peak. Driver comes on, the movie goes. He's kind of a no bullshit actor, I think, right? Absolutely, like, yeah. You know, like it's partly it's like it's not no offense to Christian Bale, but it's not Christian Bale where it's like he needs three months to go live in Antarctica. <laughs> That's the other thing. Driver does six movies a year. Yeah, he'll yeah. just show up and be like, What am I? I'm cop, there's zombies. I know what to do. I like think, I yeah. think he is very studious. I think he is very collaborative, right? I think he's just like a team player in addition to being a movie star, but it's just like, no, I'm here to serve this and like work with you well. And I, I have to imagine another part of it is that, like, he probably has a pretty reasonable quote relative to his foreign sales value because he's not trying to get, like, $20 million paychecks. He's, like, just trying to build up an insane body of work and help these movies happen. He's also incredibly confident, I think. I mean, if you look at a film, I mean, if you look at the performance in Ferrari— that is a confident performance. I mean, that is that is a bold, big. I agree. I, I'm, I'm I'm going for it performance, but because we talked about um, Christian Bale mm -hmm. and the whole, I, I know it's not correct to call it method, but sure. Because um, the thing I, I I've, I've quoted this a number of times, but the thing I remember that I find very touching is uh, Daniel Day Lewis, a thing he once said to. Um, uh, his uh, what's her name? his co-star in the fighter, who's oh Samantha Morton. No, in you mean in the boxer? Uh, in in the boxer. Emily yes. Watson. Emily, Emily Watson. Watson. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. Uh, Emily uh, Watson was kind of the Samantha Morton. Uh, right. Uh, they do well. It's fucking they're because similar. of Synecdoche yeah, where they're yeah, playing. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I always flip. And Emily it's Watson. Also like we're yeah. like, ooh, two Oscar noms for this person. I mean, great actor, but yeah. wow, yeah. she got two. Wow. Yeah. yeah. The the thing that Emily Watson asked Daniel Day Lewis was like, why do you do it like this? Like, why do you do you know wh why is this your process and he and the thing he said was because i'm not a good enough actor to do it any other way which i find very touching and incredibly revealing bale basically i have read say the exact same thing in different words where he's just like if i'm not doing this amount of work it feels like i'm not doing work yeah the job feels silly and frivolous to me it's not even like a self-importance thing but he's like, if I haven't thought through every element this seriously, I feel like I'm slacking off. I feel like what yeah. I'm doing doesn't have depth. And Philip Seymour Hoffman says the same thing or said the same thing where he was just like, uh, I, I like 
am jealous of actors who I watch can just kind of like flip it on or flip it off. Right. And I've tried giving performances where I didn't do this amount of work or intense like focus to see if I could go easier on myself. And I think they're bad. And that's the thing. I was just, I've got Killian Murphy on the mind because, you know, it's like award season. Got him and, on the line. Here he is. <laughs> um, or Killian phone is ringing. He's uh, like, I'm embarrassed that I'm doing this. Yeah. You know? No, but that was the thing that, People told me when I when I interviewed them for Oppenheimer about Kelly Murphy is just like he can just turn it on, turn yes. it off. Like he's you're, not you're, you're talking walking to him about around the ball tortured. game, and they yeah. call action, and suddenly he's in character, yes. and it's just like a switch has been turned on. Right, and right. I think there there are certain actors who talk a lot about their process in order to show off, right? Mm -hmm. But like Bale. Uh, Lewis uh, Hoffman all feel like they come by this honestly. This is oh, just yeah. how they work. They cannot work any other way. But yes, it does create this dynamic that's very different than Driver where it just feels like you talk about him being confident. You look at just the work he's done over the last 10 years. You have to be supremely confident not only to say yes to all of those parts with all of those people in wildly different circumstances, but to be like, I can work at this speed. Oh, yeah. I can just keep going from one thing to another and taking huge swings. It's a useful trait. Yeah. And I got eight inches on Oscar Isaac, so he's fuck so you. fucking tall. <laughs> <laughs> like his height is so pivotal to his performance in this movie, I think. Oh yeah. Because him is this kind of like Frankenstein lumbering around, sipping espressos and looking like he wants to walk off the edge of a cliff. Like, just doesn't make the same sense if he's small because everyone's kind of scared of this guy, right? Yes. Like, and he is this like gruff boss who watches like another guy just like fucking crash his car and like fly out of it and die. And he's just like, mm. you know, like, and then like, yeah. if he's a little guy, he would need nerviness, I think, or because it's like, how the hell does this guy run this company like this and get away with sure. it? Sure. Sure. Right. And they call him Il Commendatore. Which, which, I, which I which guess he's is demanded like, to be called, right? Yeah, this is a real is, thing. And right. it's a, I guess it was a relatively common sort of uh, term of respect in Italy, but. I think I said this in my review. Il Commendatore is also the the statue, the haunted statue that comes to life at the end of Don Giovanni, Mozart's oh, Don Giovanni. Oh yeah, cool. um, uh, Notably recreated in uh, Amadeus, but um, where he's like pointing. But, but, but like and that, that's like, kind ah! of. But that's kind of the character he's playing too. Right. It's like you know, it's like a statue come to life. It's it's really like something almost mystical about his presence. So I just like I I think I really struggled with the age thing in a thing in a way I rarely do because I actually don't demand literalism in my casting and performance usually my judgment of the two right yes and I was but even, this is clearly your problem you're you are having some issue bridging the gap between yeah yes and like and I was thinking as a counterpoint to this like a movie I love is Assassination of Jesse James in which everyone's age is wildly wrong <laughs> it is a movie where when any actor states how old they're supposed to be you're like that is insane right like Brad Pitt's 20 years older than Jesse James was when he died right and looks it and uh, uh, Sam Shepard is his brother <laughs> and is like 30 years older than him and they're like we're two thirty somethings and you're like no you're not <laughs> And I don't care. Like, I watch it and I don't care. And I remember seeing it with friends and being like, what the fuck? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. I basically Follow the mood, right? It, it doesn't matter. I don't right. care that they're not trying to make them seem younger. I don't care that they're not trying to adjust the ages to fit right. the actors. I don't care. Everyone spiritually is locking into what I think that character needs. And I don't know if it's something about the, like, the need to put the prosthetics and the padding on him, right? The need to do the accent on top of it, where it feels like there is a certain theatricality to this performance of Driver needing to play the age rather than just what I think he often does in a way that works for me of just like, I'm confident enough that even though I don't seem like an obvious casting choice for this, I'm just going to stand so firm in my commitment to playing this guy that your reality, your notion of this character warps around what I'm doing. Right. And the fact that, like, he's doing more of a voice than he usually does. Mm -hmm. He's changing his look more than he usually does. For some reason, just kept on underlining to me the gap between who he is right now and what he's playing in a way that maybe just made me feel like I would love to see him give this performance in 20 years. Mm -hmm. I would love to see him be this age where he can just roll this shit off of him, you know? Well, he probably will. He will. Yeah, I mean, right. 
Driver's definitely not an actor where I'm like, this guy's going to lose it as he gets older. I'm like, this is probably only going to get better. Pan. Right? <laughs> well, it's like uh, Russell Crowe in Russell Crowe. This guy's Crow. juiceless. Like Russell Crowe in The Insider. That's another one where Doing, it's like, like, he's so much he's a younger, younger playing an older man. Well, it's, look, and this, actually kind of, you know, aged kind of into that. Yeah. He did. I mean, The Insider is the best companion in man's filmography yeah. to this movie, Absolutely. right? To the, down to him using literally the same. The first thing I said to you after I saw it, I was like, did he just fucking use the Lisa Gerrard score again? <laughs> yeah. In the big <laughs> operatic moment again? And you were like, David, you and I are the only people who care about Like, he doesn't think anyone cares about Can this. Can I tell you like, the explanation he gave at the Q&A? Please, yeah. Was, you know, they, they cut the movie to temp tracks. And he's like, well, I, you know, I like the scores for the other movies I've done, so I'll often tell him to throw those scores in, right? Right, and right. And he's watching right. it, and then over time, you're like, well, we can replace that. We can put something else in here. And you don't want it, I guess. And then right. he just looked, yeah. and he was like, I'm not, I'm not getting anything better than that. It and, is good. And, and it was like, I don't care if I've used it in another movie. Yeah. It's just, I'm not topping that. She, he, um, she's a, what's it called? Dead, dead Can't Dance, right? That was her big, like, electronic group yeah, in the yeah, 80s or whatever. Yeah. Lisa Gerrard. And Shout he loves that Gerard. score. He loves that score. He's, he's, good. He's, he's a great score. He's, he's talked about that score multiple times. The, uh, when you were describing Driver's performance just now, mm -hmm. I kept thinking of opera. Like, you're basically describing what happens in opera, right? Yes. Where, you know, a, you know, a, a 70-year-old soprano can play, you know, someone's, you know, virginal 20-year-old daughter or whatever. I mean, it like opera turns on these kinds of um suspensions of disbelief. Yes, right? yes. Um, that's a good point, right? No, no I, right. and, and the course, film is very operatic. I mean, the well, film is far grounded away and you're in opera. Like, you know, what does he look like? You know. And this is the thing. I agree with you. And I'm the person usually saying this to other people <laughs> who I think are being persnickety. And I'm like, who gives a shit? It's like art. It's expression, right? Um, I think there's something about his performance being, by that very nature, in such a different pitch than everyone else in the mm -hmm. movie. Right where we're saying, like, what Penelope Cruz is doing is feel so bone deep and unshowy. Yeah. Where you're like, she's just holding this thing inside of her spirit and there's nothing being pushed out of her. Then a lot of the cast is like real middle aged Italian guys. He's sharing a lot of scenes with the real versions of what he's playing. Yeah, like the, oh, yeah. the sort of ensemble around him. Right. Yeah, right. The, right. The, 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 the Ferrari guys. The, the guy cutting his hair is, is the right. son of the barber, the actual barber who cut right. Enzo Ferrari's hair. Shailene is her own thing, which we can maybe We're, talk we, about. That's that's a little five minute yeah. area we need to discuss. Sure, but I think usually I want like if if there's going to be a central performance like this, I want the rest of the movie to be supporting in it in it. tone and sure. style, whatever it was. I like, mm. And I felt some disconnect. And this was my other thing with the movie. I feel like if if I'm trying to distill the cornerstone of what I like about man, right? It's this like weird friction between the operatic nature of his emotion and the drama of what he's doing and this sort of like obsessive, gritty, detail-oriented, micro-like intensity, right? And it's like these two things in contrast with each other, the like the hugest and the biggest and the tiniest uh, and, you know, operatic movies about men who cannot express a single emotion and all that sort of stuff. And this felt to me more, and even though Insider is the closest analog in his filmography, this felt to me like the first Michael Mann movie I've seen that is more mid-tones. Hmm. Where it felt like the bigger stuff was smaller than it usually is, and the smaller stuff to me felt bigger than it usually is. Um, interesting. If that makes any sense. Hmm. I don't know. It is a quiet movie. In, a, in 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 surprising ways, yeah. I think like I, the dialogue is often quiet. His yeah. he doesn't r roar at people really, you know. Even when like terrible things are happening, which may have yeah. been what Ferrari was like, I have no well, idea. That's the thing that I've from from what I gather, Enzo was kind of that kind of character who sort of took like swallowed up all the oxygen right. in the room, right? Um, right. So I think that's a choice. Uh, but it's an interesting point you make in terms of, you know, not feeling like everyone else was supporting him. I don't get I, I, that sense, but, but yeah. you know, I, I can totally, you know, it, it's understand not, I it. guess it's less like I there's a failing of other people not supporting him properly. You think he's or the, uh, matched or whatever differently than whatever the performances around the, him. Yeah. yeah, and I like I could see the movie in which I love that performance. Let's talk about Shailene Woodley. We okay. just have to do it. 
So she's in this film. I would say this this performance is I would say unpopular so far. So far, yeah. I yeah. know you're you're basically fond of it. Yeah, I I, I think she's good. I kind of like it too. But it's obviously a bit of a swerve for Italian. Yeah. She's really not giving Italian to me. Again, stereotypical Italian. Yeah. I understand mm-hmm. Italians can be all kinds of people, but in a movie where people are again sipping espresso and getting haircuts, sure. Like Italians, like or whatever, like she feels a little different. There's also the bit of, you know, I know this is now an off-repeated sort of verbal meme, but the that's a face that's seen a smartphone thing. Yes. I'm a little like, sick of that. I'm a little All sick of All these faces See, have I don't, seen smartphones. I don't believe that. Like, I don't, I mean, no, I, I, I get the criticism, but, but like, she actually seems pretty classical to me. She's very pretty. She's a very, like, yeah. pretty yeah. actor, right? Like, she's got a nice face. Yes. Like, she's not like someone where you're like, oh, what, like a sharp and sort of angular and like, you know, like, she's, She's very warm and pretty. But like Sarah Gadon, who's in this film as well. She is. Who yeah. I like a lot. A big fan. Is someone where like, wow, you can basically drop her into any time period and any genre and her look makes sense, right? She's a very yeah. striking, pretty woman, but I'm like, you can put her in like weird cronenberg future. Right. You can put her in like the Italian countryside in Roy- the 40s. Royal night out. You know, right. Yeah. Obviously, yes, David, as you said, all of these people have seen smartphones. <laughs> y- yes. Well... But I do think there's Maybe something. Maybe driver hasn't. It's, it's believable that he might, he might be not have. Right. <laughs> um, but something about Shailene feels very modern to me, and it's it's not a look thing; it's an energy thing. I think it's a but, fair point. But I think, but I think he wants her to feel modern. I think that's yeah. part of the idea. I'm there. cool with her feeling different. Right. Right. Which yes. is sort of her role. Which I'm right. into. Right. Like, right. Yeah. Like, she's this other thing he's going to. That's she, she's so the, separate. wildly different right. she's generation. A polar, and the polar opposite of. Penelope Cruz, yes. like, like Penelope Cruz is like, I mean, she, her character might as well have like a dark cloud following oh, yeah. her around, raining yeah. on her. She, you know, right? And she looks like Lee's, a paid Italian mourner. Yeah, like it, you get her to show right. up to your funeral, and go like, yeah. I love uh, you. Yeah, yeah. You know, like that's yeah. what she looks like the whole time. Yeah, and Shailene Woodley is is like just softness and light, and that's kind of the idea. I mean, that's why. That's why he wants to be with her. I mean, that's why man said he cast her. Is yeah. that like energy, right? Like, yeah. that's what he told me. It, it is a performance yet. where I just wish they'd been like, you know what? You don't even have to worry about the accent. Because I yeah. do feel like 10% self-consciousness of like trying to get her handle on it. And I think the performance is very quiet in a way that is effective, especially in contrast to uh, Penelope Cruz and feels deliberate. But it also at certain times felt like she's like, I speak really quietly, can people not hear if I'm doing the accent or not? Does it put less emphasis on it? It's a gentler accent. I mean, she's doing a gentler accent. And it, it, I mean, that's again, this sort of weird notion of, well, how much accent can we have in this movie where nobody's actually speaking with an accent? I mean, these people aren't, you know. Um, Again, it it, it works for me. And I love her, I love her speech uh, when she, you know, when she says, you know, who speaks for Piero? Mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful moment. I think she she nails that moment. I don't I don't remember where either of you stand on this movie. It's not a movie I'm particularly fond of. She's like bizarrely good in Dumb Money. Uh, oh, I think uh-huh. she's great. In, I I'm pro Dumb Money. I liked that movie. Did you see Dumb Money? I did see Dumb Money. I I enjoyed it. Um, I I took my son to see it. He he really loved it. Um. You know, we had a good time at the movies. I, I I didn't think too hard about it. I truly was like, I'm not a huge I, fan of Craig Gillespie. No, 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 neither am no, I. Neither neither are you. Three out of three. Although he's right, he's made a couple movies. No, I'm I like. saying three out of three. We all agree yeah, on yeah. that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, Craig right. Gillespie. For me, he's a, kind of like a three out of eight. If you're looking at his filmography, yeah. Um, one of those might be generous. It was <laughs> exactly. It, it was at TIFF. But it was one of those TIFF movies where it's like it's out in a week or what. You know, sure. like sure it's a TIFF, but we're about to release it. I was not even going to go. I was going to go see Dick's the Musical. Mm. And I got like shut out of that, I think. That was what happened. I got shut out of it. Still never seen Dick's the Musical. Well, Mm. some ally you are. Yeah, seriously. And so I went to the Roy Thompson Hall, which is basically like God's punishment for movies, is seeing fucking movies in this goddamn opera house in Toronto that's like terrible for seeing movies, in my opinion. Oh, really? I've never been, so. It's the one venue they use that's obviously not designed for movies at all. And like, in my opinion kind of just a stinky place to see. And it's an opera hall? It's an opera house. You know, it's a beautiful uh, theater, uh, whatever, you know, uh, concert hall. But 
uh, you know, you're sitting in the wings, like two levels up. You Sound know. is like echoing off exactly. the wall. Exactly. It's crazy. Know. It's especially a crazy place to see like basically an ensemble dramedy, like, you know, that's set in basements. Like, you know, Dumb Money yeah, is sure. not exactly like an epic. Like I saw The Woman King there and we were all kind of like going for it because like that movie's big, you yeah. know. And nonetheless, I was like, I fucking like this. Like, this is a period piece about a time that freaked me out. I mean, and nonetheless, I feel like it's nailing the mo the mood. It like, is. It is upsetting how well that movie gets the specifics. The of dumb mundane. Twenty twenty to twenty twenty one. Yeah, and you're just like, it gets the differences in each month. Of like how many things are open or what are the attitudes of people. It gets right the specifics of who's still wearing a mask at what point and who isn't. Right. Yes, all that shit. Yeah. It just felt right. And also just felt like it got the mood of us at that moment of like, these there's fucking rich people doing stuff right now. They have whole tennis courts. Right. You know what I mean? Like like the true like everywhere, you know, feeling of like, these guys got to go. Because yeah. the whole thing with dumb money was like, what do the hedge funds do? I don't even know, but I know it's not good. Like, and it's time yeah. for us to get that money. I think she's really good she in that is, movie. Yeah, she's very good. In and she's good just, and, and kind of a tough role. Yes. Boring, supportive wife role. Should yeah. be nothing. And you're like, fuck, this is Shailene Woodley stuck in this role? Like, that's rude to her. And then you watch her make so much more out of it that it doesn't become a thankless role. But it is funny. She is someone where I just still think like, oh, isn't she like 22? And it's like, no, she's in her 30s. It feels like she's 32. too young to be playing these, like, kind of exhausted mother roles. Yeah. But then you're like, no, she's actually older than the real woman would have been in, in Ferrari's life at that point in time by a good chunk of years. Right. Yeah, I mean, she's a, she's an exhausted mother herself probably at yeah. this point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just rewatched The Descendants and— uh, She's good enough. She's— Fantastic. I mean, that's when everyone thought she was the person. Yeah. Yeah. It was that, and then following that with uh, Spectacular Now, which was this, like, very real and, like, Mm -hmm. lovely, you know, young performance. And then the first Divergent was big, and it was like, I guess she has the Kristen Stewart career. I guess she's going to just, like— Oh, Mm -hmm. you're forgetting another gigantic movie she was in. What's that? Fault in Our Stars. I'm not not being sarcastic. Like, Oh, I was— I was conflating Spectacular Now and Faulkner Stars. Yeah, she's mind. in both of them. Yes, right. Yes. Like Spectacular Now being a better version of the yes. weepy teen. But she's incredibly film. good. And then Faulkner Stars was huge. It was played like a fucking Hunger Games movie or whatever, yeah. right? It was a three three hundred million dollars. Like it's funny what and then she was in Big Little Lies. And right. it's like that show's a big deal. Everyone forgets she's she yes, one of the main totally three forgot characters. She's in, I totally Everyone forgot she's in that else. show. Like, Zoe Kravitz, like, popped off of that more than she did in the, like, Thankless Born. I feel like she's the one who never got nominations. Yeah. Like, she's weird in that she doesn't have a bad career, but there was certainly that moment 10 years ago where it's just, like, Oscar nominations imminent. Yeah. And right. also, she seems to be a crossover. A, like the kids actually box like her. office. Right, they'll they'll come out for her. Right, she's gonna do both, and then she's sort of just like floated. A no, little by bit. like 2016, she's in Snowden, in right. the dumb money role of right, like, right. oh Snowden, how are you doing? Which is I a terrible okay. movie. Right, and that terrible. really bad that's movie. a worse version of that role when you're like, it's actually way too early for you to be taking this. Yeah. It's weird. I mean, I know she like eats dirt. And like is dated Aaron Rodgers. I know she's like an she odd puts person. Clay on her butt. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it dismissively. Everyone, no, I'm every th- actor should be crazy. Yes. Ben Ben suddenly was like, she eats dirt. <laughs> I think she Go eats on. dirt, right? Like, wasn't she's, that? The I thing? think she like talks about suntanning her butthole. It, it, well, that's like, fine. Suntan away. Not, all of this is good. We all like all of. She it. eats dirt she, and clay. Yes, yeah, she eats dirt and clay, Ben. <laughs> For what end? I don't know. She thinks it's good. For it's pure. <laughs> I don't know. She has some. What's the sun tanning your butt part? <laughs> she. I. This is a real thing. Am I not? Am I? No, I believe you're I'm right. All but certain. I, she's I, like, I well, we never sun that area of our bodies. Yeah. You have to do it. Lots of people now, right? Or you're like, yeah, you know, you know, get naked, get outside, and really, you know, let the sun in on the places it does not shine, yeah, as, but, as as the saying goes. But she's is, not being is, that general about it. Is maybe. this a rich person thing that we have to maybe. do? Maybe. I mean, but in, she's in like. Your, a, compound you know she's got the yeah, sort of you need so, a lot of like space you know yeah. how some yes, celebrities there are, you know like butthole tanning beaches where everybody's just got their <laughs> Twitter mean, runs up Robin Williams had right, that line yeah, yeah, yeah. he always said of like cocaine is God's way of telling you you have too much money right is is butthole tanning the way <laughs> now for a new generation 
<laughs> I, 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 there's just this, there's a few celebrities who get diverted onto that kind of au naturel path, yeah. right? Where they start going on Leno being like, yeah, I just eat alfalfa sprouts all day and that's why I'm like this. Mm-hmm. And most people are like, oh, what a lunatic. And other, some people are like, I'm going to do it too. I don't know. Um, she's okay in this movie. Is the I, think fundamental thing. I think she's good in this movie. The the plot of the movie is sort of like, I mean, like it's what we said. It's that like Ferrari has lost his son, mm-hmm. Dino, mm-hmm. right? His son died in his 20s, right? Of sort of like he was like 20. Gastroenteritis anyway. or something. It was some kind of like progressive, you know, unsolvable digestive thing, right? Like just a disease. Okay. Uh and uh he's so he's it grieving. His business is struggling because you don't make any money racing cars and smashing them up and killing people. Well, which is the he's rival. not interested in selling cars. Right, right. So he's sort of doing that as a means to an end. Who's the rival they talk about where he Maserati. says, like, right, our, our philosophies are different. He uh, races cars in order to sell cars, and I uh, sell cars in order to race cars. He says something right. to that, that, that That's actually a Jaguar, I believe, that he says Oh, okay. that. oh that's yeah. right. Right. But the whole thing with Jaguar but, was... But he's got rivals with Maserati, yeah. Right, Jaguar, another sports car company yeah. that starts selling their cars and no one knew how to operate them yes. because they were not made for consumers. Yeah. And so then Jaguar acquired this like reputation as like they make lemons, right? Like uh-huh. people would be like, I spent so much money on this fucking car and I can't even start it. Like, and like it's because these cars were just not, you know, no one had figured this out yet. And that's yeah, what so he's starting happens to figure with Ferraris out. Ferraris too. Yeah, exactly. But this sort of he's philosophy. selling like some shake, you know, a fucking Ferrari that just raced, and the guy's like, "Where's the? I don't get it. Like, where's but this philosophy? Oh. Doesn't turn. Has, like, <laughs> yeah, right. A lot of these other companies use racing as a way to billboard their product and to like yeah. build their brand name. And he's like, "No, racing is like means to an end in and of itself for me." Right. I'm annoyed that I even have to sell a single car. Because those are companies. And, right. And this is, I mean, it's a company, but really, I mean... It's like a church. Within the schema of the film, it's a guy. Yeah, and it's right. a church. I mean, it's a way of life. It's yes. not a company. Right, it's a dogma. Did you visit, like, Ferrari in Modena? Like, no. They have a factory there. They so. do, actually. The factory is in... Um, is in the town right next to right, Modena. Sure. Um, all right, all right. No, okay, it's, okay. which is funny because it apparently has always been there, right. but it was only very briefly in Modena, but he lived in Modena, so that, that's the shorthand for right. everything. But they're, they're actually in, I did not visit the factory. It's uh, in, you're right, Maranello. <laughs> Maranello, yes. Right. Uh, which is right in the province of Modena. Um, so he's he's got the bi- the business, the, the, the you know, the creditors are breathing down his neck. Mm-hmm. He is getting ready for a race. He watches a guy race around a track. The guy fucking absolutely eats it and gets <laughs> smashed against the wall. The car is destroyed. His girlfriend is crying about it. And mm. Ferrari's like, eh, annoying. Right? So he's got that yes. problem. <laughs> yes. His wife is basically a living thundercloud uh-huh. who, in the opening minutes of the movie, aims a gun at him, shoots it. Yes. And then is like, there's more where that comes from, you <laughs> asshole. <laughs> yeah. Is it her, is it his mother in the house? Yeah, that's yeah. his mother. His mother is basically this like right one thousand year old witch who just like walks around in the house. You and, know, and, and, she look, rocks and actually says the words, which which are apparently things she a thing that she actually did say, used to say, which is the wrong kid died. Yeah, like she's basically <laughs> Robert Patricking and walk harding it up, but like the is, real life Robert this Patrick. Is, to my point, like the performance she's giving. Feels like they built a time machine, took Ferrari's yeah. actual elderly mother I out know. of the 40s and put her in a scene next to Adam Driver where you're like, I'm watching the real thing. Yes. Right. She this does is just feel... a real old Italian and lady she's fantastic. who doesn't feel like she's acting and is incredible. So uh, that's going on. His uh-huh. wife. He, and then, of course, he has a second child with uh, another lady that his wife does not know about, but every single other citizen of Italy does know about, it right. seems. The right? only thing of the <laughs> yes. movie is him waking up in bed with Shailene Woodley, right. kissing his son goodbye right. for the day, quietly pushing a, a speed car yes. out of the driveway, and then trying to, as, as subtly... Uh, as possible, get across town to his wife to be there in the morning. When she when wakes up, up. and yeah. she knows he's been out all night, which is why she shoots the gun. We should also say there's the wonderful 
black and white footage of young Ferrari driving, right? You know, in that crazy, like, uh, old fashioned, you know, over yeah. which is cool. And, and Cruz basically to says, like, film. I know you sleep around, but the agreement has always been you're here before, like, the coffee right. is The right, morning right. coffee That's arrived. And as right. she's saying that, the coffee is arriving right. behind and He's me. like, oh, no problem. Okay, I'm going right. to go watch someone else explode. So there's, like, an admission that this marriage is, like, beyond broken, loveless, tense, tortured, like, clouded by the, the, the death, all of this sort of stuff. But she's still obsessed with the appearances of, like, I cannot be seen as the woman who is being stepped down on also right. he she's entangled in the business he relies yes. on her to run the business she's the one going to the bank which seems to be in like one of 80 churches the <laughs> bank is the big she, marble building and she owns half the business right, right. yes yeah he can't do anything without her yeah uh and then right and then he needs to win this race because the stakes are if you win the race your business is saved yeah you can sell more cars. You can take out a, I don't know, whatever. And I guess there's sort of the notion of like he might sell to Fiat. Right. He might sell a partnership with a bigger company, which he did. By which the he way. eventually yeah, did. Yeah. Right. But he's obviously is offensive to him because it's like they'll, they'll ruin the purity of what I'm doing here. And they'll, I guess he's, when he sold, he did get what he wanted, which was basically like, I do the race cars. You can do whatever you well, want. Well, that's the thing. Right. I mean, that's the, the, the sort of subplot in the movie about him trying to make sure that if he does sell, he can do it while still retaining control of the company, right. mm -hmm. and he and he does a nice job of playing playing Ford off Fiat off fi off Fiat right. uh, by placing that that rumor in the newspaper. But by design, this guy is uh, pretty inscrutable, right? Where like, I mean, man, just talked a lot in the Q and A about just liking how much this guy was like nothing but contradictions and contradictions that he himself would not even attempt to process. The other thing, though, that 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 really jumps out at me about this movie is that, in some ways, I think it's maybe man's most personal film. Okay, I mean, because Let's this is hit me with that. Yeah. Well, this is the this is this is the only protagonist he has who could be called a creator of sorts, sure. an artist. Yes, right? mm. he's absolutely um, an artist. I mean, he yeah. talks. I mean, he talks about design, and there's that, that that great scene where he's talking to young Piero and and says when when you know. When things work better, they're more pleasing to the eye. Um, it is interesting that now that you're pointing this out, most of the man characters who feel like the closest analogs for himself are criminals. Are criminals, and, 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 obviously. Right. Yeah. right. But yeah. even like Public Enemies and yeah. Heat and all these movies where you're just like Black Hat to a degree where it's like guys who have this obsessive pursuit of becoming great and having a complete understanding yeah. of a thing. But also total independence. Like the, all those yes. characters. Like Thief, Heat, Black Hat, these are right. guys who are like, you know, you don't work for them. You work for yourself. But that right. becomes yeah. their medium. Like their crime is their medium right. that they work in. You're right that this is the first character who is like a creative right and, and and it's like the whole film in some ways feels like almost like an apologia for man's career because he is also a person who who really drives people pretty hard from yeah. everything i've heard um yeah. you know i mean yeah, you certainly hear that he's yeah i mean irascible i don't know how to I mean, put did you, you know. hear the ruffalo quote recently his no. downey jr actors on actors so but he said good. something to the effect of like uh i'll find it uh because it, it, it was, was, it was comparing him to Fincher. David Fincher makes Michael Mann look like the guy running the McDonald's drive thru on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> that was exactly it. Yes. Yeah. But like uh, the thing about the thing about Mann, though, is you know, I mean, I've I've heard that he's he's very intense to deal with. He's very, I mean, he he'll run you ragged. Mm -hmm. Like not, I've never heard of him being abusive or anything like that, but no. but just like one of these people who will like like Demanding, work you to intense, the bone. Exactly, and you, he yeah. works that and, much. So right, why and he's aren't you there. Or like he's right. there working yeah. with you, and you know, I mean, I, I've talked to editors who you know who've cut films for him while other editors were cutting the same film. Yeah, and it's like I did all this work and none of it wound up in the movie, like that kind of stuff. Um, I, I mean, I hope know. it's okay for me to repeat this, but I remember you telling me at some uh, uh, public talk Q and A you did with him. <laughs> <laughs> that when you were backstage waiting to go yeah. on, he was like furiously shadow boxing. So yes, this was this was when we did the BAM thing. And um was that for the black hat? Yeah. I mean this is yeah. um this was the, the year of cut. black hat. This was when they did the big BAM retro and, and right. I did this like hour and a half conversation with man. Mm -hmm. Um it was like the biggest thing I'd done, like and biggest QA I'd ever done. And I was also going through a period at, at the time when I was having like 
like genuine panic attacks when uh-huh. I had to talk in front of anything more than two people. I fucking get it, bro. Um, and and I had sort of, I mean, I, I was looking forward to this thing, but also dreading it, and I was yeah. so nervous. And the only way to kind of get over it for me was to just sit and just like breathe quietly in the dark and just like mm-hmm. like empty my brain. Right. And so, but like they 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 sort of made us wait right out like behind the stage while like the, like the, the head of BAM and all these people like were doing their introductions, and we're sitting in the dark. And there, there's this like row of chairs. I'm sitting in a chair just trying to like collect myself so I don't like freak out. L- literally like shit my pants on stage in front of like 500 that people. Might at be interesting. I mean, it would be notable. Good opening gambit. Right. <laughs> notable. Um, uh, shit my pants. What do you think? Like, what do you think about that? <laughs> Meanwhile, and I asked him right beforehand. I said, um, "Do you ever get nervous?" before these things and he says oh, no I, I never get nervous but I, I i have a lot of nervous energy that i have to that i have to yeah. sort of work out right and so i'm sitting there in the dark meanwhile he's pacing shadow boxing like punching the air and like guzzling bottles of water like just yeah. like just downing bottles of water and and i'm just sitting there going I am not relaxed at all. <laughs> right, this is not helping you yeah. like calm down. Yeah, but as you said, he does seem to have weirdly chilled out yeah. the last couple he of years. He definitely didn't have oh, yeah. that vibe. He's at like yeah, a he's very old. different pitch now. He's also he's hard of hearing, and like that's sort of like I mean, in like a sort of regular old guy way. I think. Well, I think I think I think he lost some of his hearing doing the the shootout in Heat. That's yeah, what I had wow, heard. That movie is fucking loud yeah. as hell. Uh, but like his vibe was definitely not shadow boxy when I met yeah. him. It was like nice, you know, older guy. Like, but there's, yeah, but, yes, but, but this was like a public appearance yeah, thing. So yeah, I, th- yeah. so I, I think was, that was, was more, more. He was like yeah, psyching yeah. himself. But he's up. always had that sort of restless energy. And as you're saying, this movie feels a little more contemplative and a little yeah. more retrospective about like his life and his legacy and his persona and all of that filtered through this guy. Yeah, I think I think there's something, and I asked him about this and he didn't really answer it, so didn't mind. A question it directors either. love, like, yeah. are you like this guy yeah. that you just made the movie about? Yeah, are, but are it's you obviously like this guy the most obvious who, like, question. killed nine people. <laughs> yeah, um, right, right, who watches people explode and is yeah. like, annoying for me personally and I don't care about them. <laughs> but um, Now they'll never finance my next picture. No, the fucking yeah. wife is blah, 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 blah. No, he doesn't quite say that, but he kind of does. I mean, after the first guy dies, he's like his girlfriend and his mom so yeah. annoying you know um but i do think that i mean these people aren't necessarily always aware of how much they relate to these oh, to these course, characters right. uh, yes. so i mean i asked him about it and, and he answered something completely different but i do he feel said, like in 1742 in this <laughs> town they're <laughs> you just start be the blacks are in dolby it's a 2000 range yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, right, at that point no one did cobblestone streets <laughs> it was always <laughs> limestone <laughs> thief is about marxist ideology yeah. it's my favorite thing he keeps trying oh, yeah. you know which is true like yeah. Um, um but yeah anyway so so no so i do think that there is like this weird connection he has to enzo ferrari which also mm-hmm. explains why he's been trying to make this movie for 30 years sure. yes um and trying to make yeah. a movie that is maybe less dynamic than the movies he's made recently like black hat public enemies miami vice collateral those are action movies Public Enemies is maybe the most sort of period biopic of mm-hmm. those four movies, but it's still a movie with shootouts and yeah. car chases and Tommy well, and guns. And it's one of and... those things where it's like, I, I weirdly going back to Jesse James again, but like Andrew yeah. Dominic talked about like developing a bunch of movies that he couldn't get off the ground after Chopper, right? Which didn't do well here, but was a big calling card yeah, movie. Calling card movie. And his like agent was like, come on, we got to get something we can sell. And he's like, well, I read this book on Jesse James. I like, it. and he was like, Jesse James, I can. See. I heard of that guy, <laughs> right? And he was like, well, my take's gonna be like a moody and a sort of meditative right. thing. He's like, doesn't matter. Jesse James is like Batman, especially if you get Brad Pitt. To that play was him. the argument. Yeah. He was yeah. like, if I can get an A list star and say it's a Jesse James movie, we can trick people into giving us money because on paper, people can see in their head, oh, they're like guns and robberies. And in a similar way, you're like Michael Mann saying Ferrari. And here's a big leading 100%. man. 100%. People are like, oh, it's fucking Michael Mann. And the cars are going to be Is he like, going to win the Grand Prix? And it's like, right. nah, bro, he didn't drive. He was, <laughs> right. he was yeah. just the grumpy owner. But it's almost surprising it took him this long to get the movie made, even if the movie he wanted to make was so different than what people would imagine. It's the kind of pitch you think would trick people. Yeah. How many times did you see Blonde? Four. Bill Son of a bitch. Yeah, I, I know you liked Blonde. Blonde. I loved yeah, it. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say that's self-harm. <laughs> 
Oh, God, that was a movie where I was writhing in my seat. One day I will give Blonde another chance because I do like show, yeah. all of his other movies. Yeah. Basically. And Assassination of Jesse James, by the way, if you ever read the novel, it's just like the movie. Right. Which yes. Is, yeah. Which is great. Like, so people knew what they were getting into, or but, they should have known, but, but they didn't because they, they thought like, Jesse counter James to Brad Ferrari. Pitt. Yeah. It was like no one even thought about it. They were just like Jesse James, Brad Pitt, done. He yep. could point to the book as many times and as he like wanted. Brad Pitt's main character, and he was like, "Yeah, sure, he's got the main <laughs> character." Yeah. Um, Ferrari. Wait, I had a point about Ferrari. I've lost it. Uh, I don't well, I, I was going to say, I mean, but the the racing sequences are incredibly dynamic. They are. I mean, Incred there's a contrast here between sort of the the very staid, classical, intimate scenes in the yes. film, and then you know just the absolutely unhinged racing sequences. Yeah. Obviously, it's you know, the big racing scene is the Milla Milla which is at the end of the movie, but mm -hmm. is is pretty awesome until, of course, you know, the and, catastrophe. Yeah, I wouldn't call that part awesome. No, I would call that part bad. But this is... Um, but before that, it's like yeah. the, the test sequence, which is cool, the, yeah. uh, the, the, the test drive, which also ends in catastrophe. Uh -huh. Is there a third racing sequence I'm forgetting? There's a brief racing sequence, that a snippet of a race that we see in where, between the two. That's where the he's scene beating where, the time or whatever? No, when we see the... Um, when the cars go through the flames, oh, yeah, that's a that different cool. race. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, right. it's brief. Right. And right, they actually right. they actually perform poorly at that race. Right. So, which then sets up the Mille Mille as being stakes, like even right. more important. Um, obviously, he brings in Patrick Dempsey, who is a real race car driver, basically, right? Like, yeah. isn't he and, one of those and actors been, who yes. just and does this? And has been this? trying to make a race car movie for a long time. Uh, to play Piero Tar Tarufi, Tarufi, yeah, who is the winner of the Mila Mila? No, I talked to people I who were like that. That is an inexplicable casting. Why is he in this movie? And it's like he probably demanded to be in this movie. <laughs> He's kind of awesome in He's this great. movie. And, I really and like Jack O'Connell. I mean, all the, they're actually Jack like big, good. big actors. I, I want to talk about Jack O'Connell for five seconds, and I'll let people extrapolate what they want from this statement. But I have heard that Patrick Dempsey, while filming other things, will get annoyed about the amount of takes he has to do because it's stealing time away from his racing. Right. He likes to race. Yes. Uh, it went from hobby to obsession for him, much like it's gone like with Michael Fassbender right. and like, I feel like there's a couple But other. it's like, this is his main thing. And um, then if the pitch is like, you get to play a racer, he's like, well, this is the kind of acting I like. Jack O'Connell, who I was just like, so convinced 10 years ago was kind of a Shailene the Woodley guy. Yeah. And I remember seeing Startup and yeah. going, holy shit, this fucking guy, undeniable. And next year he's got fucking Unbroken. And right. it was like, if this is what he did in Startup and Unbroken a year out looked like the cannot beat Oscar front runner. Yeah, I remember that. You're like, can you believe this story? And it's Joe Lee and she's kind of developing her muscles as a director. And the Coens wrote it. The movie's a hit. It does nothing for his career. Because nobody actually liked that. Movie. No, right. but it makes a hundred million domestic. It did. it did. And then he's just fallen into this like money monster. Well, he's really bad in Money Monster, in my opinion. Yeah, that's but that like was, that's a really bad performance. That was another moment of a major no, movie right. star being like, "I'm I'm calling the shot." Angelina Jolie is pointing to Jack O'Connell. George Clooney is pointing to Jack O'Connell. All these people are like, "We know it when we see it." He's the next guy. He's playing Amy Winehouse's awful husband in the Amy Winehouse <sighs> that is movie, good casting. which is good casting. Blake Field or Civil, a, a, a man whose birth certificate I pulled back when I was an intern in People Jeez. Magazine. Uh, where they People Magazine was very much like, "We need to know everyone's age," huh. because People Magazine, you know. Uh, Shailene Woodley, comma, 32. They love like, that is the style. You yeah. have to put their age. And so my job as an intern was to go to the British Birth, Marriage, and Death Office, which I think still exists, which you enter this giant room They're that just still says being born and births, and dying. <laughs> marriages, <laughs> deaths. Wow. Like, there are three wings. <laughs> yeah. And you can, you can go look up, like, Charles Dickens' birth certificate because yeah. they've been keeping these records. And I would pull everyone, every mm -hmm. minor British celebrity's birth certificate for them. Mm-hmm. Including Blake Field, Field or Civil. I just don't think that's a role that's going to help him. I was going to say, yeah. I, I think that is good casting and it's not going to help him. And he's probably, you know, suffering a little bit from the fact that, you know, he's becoming a movie star right as the age of the movie star is yes. declining. You and know? I, there's just like six or seven English actors who are handsome and talented that are the same age. You know, who's the guy in Midsommar? Oh, Jack Rayner. Jack Rayner. Who's the guy in Dunkirk? Um, 
Jack Loudon. All these fucking Jacks, jacks for yeah. crying out loud. Yeah, like, I just we've got the Chris's, they've got the Jacks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like they're all pretty good. <laughs> and I agree with you, Griffin. When I saw Starred Up, yeah. uh, the David McKenzie movie. I too was like, right, uh, this is the birth of a major. This guy's talent. at a different right. level than Absolutely. those other guys, right? I don't know what to tell you, he's man. He's good in this, but like, he's also just part of the ensemble. What I like about Dempsey is just his look. I mean, the look feels incredible. perfect, yes. and his his confidence is is ingrained. Like and, he just this guy actually knows what he's and doing. And his white hair, for some reason, looks way more realistic than Driver's it white does. hair. I think it's yes. because Driver's hair is so iconic. Yes. Yeah. It's maybe. so crucial to but, Driver. But, but Dreamy's hair is also well, iconic. They basically, there were you know articles what, written that about is a hair. good point. Dempsey's got a famous head of hair. Yeah. You're right. You're right. But it's been a while, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And with Mc, with McDreamy, it's basically the exact same hairstyle just in shock white. Versus Shock Driver, way. you're just like, what is this? Like I was even googling what was, cool, what was the last. It's time like he... the, the Victor Victoria way, right? right, right <laughs> that, just uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Julie shave Andrews and or... then boom. What, what was I the know, last I time was he fucked with his hair? What was the last time he did have long hair? Like when he's in '65, he has the shoulder length black hair. Why? Yeah. Because that's what Adam Driver looks like. Right. Why, why should an astronaut have hair like that? Doesn't matter. That's yeah. what Adam Driver looks like. Yes. Uh, white noise. He's got you know kind of the sort of again he's made well he's up. doing yes that's yeah. more Ferrari look right prosthetics and ball. but that's yeah, another like, role that he's ten to fifteen years too young for yeah he's good in that movie I mean, he's, he's that really movie so that. weird but I mean my take on that movie is it should have been Giamatti but well I mean it, sure. all parts should most be things Giamatti. should be Giamatti. Yeah, yeah. Giamatti should have played Ferrari <laughs> <laughs> you should play the cars I I I, I, I will <laughs> say I'm wrong I will say <laughs> I'm a car I'm going fast. <laughs> what do you mean I'm breaking down? I wish I could do him. I know. Ferrari and private parts would be actually a really interesting double feature. Go on. Okay. A driven, powerful, driven. <laughs> influential you artist. You could almost imagine pig vomit walking into you could. Ferrari yeah. and and uh, and schooling them on the correct pronunciations of things. Stop um, racing! <laughs> WNBC. Um, but... I mean, going back to Driver for a moment. Yeah, I, I should clarify. I think this is the best performance he's ever given. Yeah. I mean, I, Bill is all in on this. And this I, is no, like, I, this I, is like I my performance yes. of the year, and, yeah. and I and I can't imagine anyone else playing this part ever again. Here's this. my struggle: is I'm like, I, I clearly bumped on this performance. I cannot name who I think it should have been. And usually, I sure. feel mm -hmm. like when I bump on a casting Giamatti? in a movie, Giamatti. Yeah, it's Paul Jim. Christian Bale. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd be interested to see the Bale version. Of I it, prefer certainly. Driver to Bale oh, yeah. in every way. And I, I mean, I, I do like Bale. Christian Bale is maybe my favorite actor working still, but yeah. But for me, I mean, Driver is this is this character now. Wow. Yeah. I love him in this. I just look. I said it to you. I like movies about Italians yelling at each other as well. Like I just like that it's a Ferrari movie that feels like fucking. Journey to Italy or whatever, yeah, like half sure. the time. Yes. Like I just can't believe he made a ninety-five million dollar movie where the most tense and involving sequences are him and Penelope Cruz, basically in a not loveless marriage because they do sort of have sex. Like there is like there's passion between. There's them. intense emotion between them, but it's not uh, a but functional like, facing each other down. Like right. those are the sequences where I'm gripping my seat the most. Yeah. Maybe that yeah. or me going like, why is this guy filming the screen? And then Manola just diving towards him. I heard that's what Michael Mann's next movie is going to be about. <laughs> about the guy who filmed Ferrari? Yeah, that's the title. It's called The Guy Who Filmed Ferrari. <laughs> and Adam Driver's playing Manola Dargis. Isn't he, he wrong for that it. part? He wants to do it. He, he has a take. Uh, <laughs> um, I like the performance a lot. Um, but I tend to... I think I like Adam Driver more than you do, though. I don't know if that's true. Wow. Because I was All also right, watching fine. this and being like, Adam have Driver's I actually... Fan ever bumped on him before. What know. is your favorite Adam Driver performance? That's Patterson. a good question. Well, that's your favorite. That's what I'm saying. Which one? Patterson. Oh, Patterson. One of Patterson. my favorite movies. Great, great, great movie. I mean, it's like a lame answer, but I do think he is uh, specifically absurdly good in Last Jedi. He is? Oh, yeah. I mean, sure. he's great as Kylo he's a, Ren. He's a, he's a good Kylo Ren. Uh, he is... I think Giamatti could have nailed it, though. I mean, I think... like I'm, Annette is weirdly way up there for me of just, like, have few movies played more with how weird he is as a movie star? Mm. Like, with the Annette, stretchiness of him, you know? I, the, my, my problem with Annette when I saw it was the stand-up comedy, and that might still be my problem with it, although I respect how, you know, balls out he is. In yeah, those. what if he you, does is captivating. Did, right. did, like, did you, you, did you, you know, watch it once? I just okay. saw it one time. Okay. 
See, that's right. an example. No, because I was mixed on it when I first saw it. And no, no. as I kept going back to it, it became my favorite movie of that year. I liked it a lot when I first saw it with reservations, mm-hmm. and it sat with me nicely. And I rewatch sequences from it all the time. But mm-hmm. I should sit down and, you know, but meet, that's meet an example again. for me where I'm like, him not being funny doesn't matter to me. Like, and I heard, I oh, had yeah. this conversation with a, right. lot, of a lot of people, people are of like, like, what the hell is this? Well, it right. falls this... apart when he's on stage doing stand up, and I'm like, he's getting at an idea. Right in a way I care about more than him ever seeming like a comedian. And I think it has, like, the proper dramatic effect. And also, him just pacing around that stage for, like, ten minutes at a time. I'm like, this is the most captivating it's shit I've hard, I would watch ever to seen. Do. Yeah. yeah, I would watch this. I would pay to go see this. He would become he would become a celebrity doing that. He would. If, if there was a comedian out there who was doing, I guess, anti-comedy of that type, the, there are a lot of comedy uh, comedians I mean, are, also today who are unconsciously doing what he's doing. <laughs> All right, now I'm trying to think <laughs> of think other... they're telling jokes yes, and are just indeed. ranting about things. I'm trying to think of 50-something actors who could play Ferrari now. Uh, this like, is the thing. Know, I like, don't So it's have... like Clooney, you know, like guys like this, like Colin Firth, uh, fucking... But then I'm like, these guys are all... Daniel Craig. Too suave, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there's something about, like, if he is more conventionally... And Christian Bale's obviously a very handsome guy, but there's that innate coldness to him. Ray Fiennes? Fiennes is interesting. I got the build for it. Fiennes is interesting. Fiennes is too short, though. He's, a, a lot of these guys group. are kind of more on the slight yeah. side, right? And he's supposed to be imposing. Uh, Fiennes is wiry and short. Yeah. Well, he's He's got the hair. <laughs> he's got that Ferrari hair, basically. No, uh, he doesn't. <laughs> Wait, does he? Isn't he bald? That's what I mean. Like, if he's got the high uh, forehead. Oh, I see. You okay, know, yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I don't... It's not like there's someone screaming... You know, to me, like, no, yeah, no, and I've been like stewing on it for a week or two now. Wow, Minestrone over here. Yeah, yeah the, well, that's what they call me <laughs> when I walk down the streets. They go, "Hey, Minestrone, <laughs> you got any better Ferrari castings yet?" I go, "No, Tony, still working on it." Are there other scenes in Ferrari we need to discuss? We haven't been going through the plot sequentially, but that's fine. But like, what haven't we touched on in Ferrari so far? If there are anything, the church scene. The church intercut with the, the 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 workers' mass intercut with the the um, oh the stopwatches yeah the stopwatches, the stopwatches in, you know the, the the priest's sermon which about, is basically about how you know if if Jesus lived today he would be a metal worker in right, the Ferrari right. factory <laughs> the, the the sort of all the stuff where you're driving home that this is like a company town and like this is the only game in town. Although mm-hmm. no one mentions vinegar. They are making vinegar. I right? know. They never mention vinegar. They, there should be one scene where he meets with the vinegar guy and is like, how you doing? And he's like, oh, vinegar up the ass. It's going crazy. Fiat wants to buy me the Fiat of vinegars. <laughs> you're sticking vinegar up your ass? Does Shailene Woodley recommend that? Um, but uh, the, the other, right, the other, um, f- you know, the scenes with his son Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where his he's like helping his son like look at the blueprints yeah. and I mean, like talk about talk engines. about a scene that those feels scenes are quite autobiographical lovely. of right. just like here is Michael Mann's philosophy on life. I yeah. think the things that work the best end up being the most beautiful. Yeah, which is basically the philosophy behind doing the amount of research he does. Right. Yeah, like his studiousness and the construction of his projects is whether or not any of that is surface level, textual, noticeable. I think all of that comes across in the function of the machine and then it provides it with a level of beauty, which is fascinating for a guy who at times was slammed for being like substance, uh, obsessive substance over entertainment and at other times was slammed for being style over substance. Too slick. Yeah, and it, and it's not also, uh, I mean, he's he's not a, a director like a, a, like a Nolan or even a Kubrick who has kind of an engineer's mind with when it comes to things like story and no, character, right. very much. You know, not. He's, he's, I mean, he's still very much a vibe. I hate this expression, no, but very much a yes. vibes based director when but it comes to thing. things like narrative. At different times, people have been like, "This is all just like mood. It's all look. It's all yeah. style, right?" And at oh. other times, people have been like, "He's just obsessed with all this fucking research he did, yeah. and he doesn't know how to put it in like a dramatic package for us to relate to." He, he's a bit like, and I, and I think. Man himself would probably reject this comparison, but he's a bit like Terrence Malick in that sense, you know, because Terrence Malick is also one of those filmmakers where people are like, well, I, I couldn't tell what anybody like what anybody was saying. I right, couldn't right. hear the dialogue. Malick's the most extreme. I version couldn't tell of this. who right. was who. That kind of thing. Yeah. 
uh, you know, this you, is interesting source material. Why did he have to like fuck it up by yeah. focusing on all these birds? <laughs> right, and, and he clearly knows everything about this subject, but it doesn't necessarily right. always come across. Well, right. and also um, his style of just like I'm going to shoot so much, yeah. and it'll it'll all get figured out later. But why? Right. right. Why yeah. dig into all of that if you're not going to make the effort of communicating any of that to us? Why put that work under the hood? Right. Because I th I think I think people like this believe that. That work, like, there's an intuitive connection that I we agree. make with viewers. Yeah, right. I mean, right. That's the confession yeah. of that scene with the son. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. There's also, I mean, the the opera He's scene I find daughter, fascinating too. Right, Michael Mann. He's got three. Three daughters. Yeah. Uh, uh, three or four. Michael Mann, four. like raising three to four daughters. House full of girls. is a sitcom premise. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, oh, yeah. You know, meeting the boyfriends or you know, like. I heard a story. It was so funny. Actually, this was when I was first. Uh, when at my first screening of Ferrari, yeah. for some reason it was packed, sure. not with it, cr other critics or anything like that. I think it was all people from like one magazine, mm -hmm. um, Michael Mann magazine. No, it was, it was like Mann it was Weekly. like a Vogue or GQ or, sure. or one of these magazines. Sure. It was like their entire or they're considering like, a cover yeah, like their story entire or creative right. staff or something mm -hmm. like right. that. And and bef but I got there early and I I, I didn't know who this was. It might have been like the projectionist or maybe somebody was talking about how when he was. He was in high school. He dated one of Man's daughters. Wow! And 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 but there was actually a very sweet story. He said, "Talk uh, about a Meet the Parents remake." Well, I that's the see. thing. He said, "He said he said he went out to dinner with them once, yeah. and then on the way back, Michael Mann said, "Here, I'll drive you home." And he, he uh, and Michael Mann had his Ferrari with him, and he drove this guy home in his Ferrari, just like gunning it. <laughs> yeah. And the guy understood this was Michael Mann saying, don't fuck with me or my family. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I have the power to kill you. And meanwhile, he's just uh, staring him down in the rear view mirror yeah. yelling, what do you know about high tensile metals? <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, Ferrari, a movie about metals. True. Oh, yeah, yeah man. That was the that was your first lead, right? That was the lead yeah, of your first my, review. It's a movie about metals. Yeah. Uh, that, was my, that was my tweet. That was your tweet. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Right. And now I'm off Twitter. I don't get to see know. you know fun little yeah, like, pithy what, tweets. What a mistake you've made. We don't. We don't what call it. We don't call it Twitter anymore. Oh, of course. I'm sorry. Yeah. I've you, left X. You've X'd, X'd out of your life. I X'd fucking, X. I fucking X'd it out. Yeah. Um. What was the other scene I was going to bring up? Oh, the scene. I mean, Driver talked about this a lot at the Q and A. The funniest thing was I saw I saw this with my dad, and my dad turned to me when Michael Mann was talking and went, "Where's he from?" And I was like, what are you, fucking Chicago? No <laughs> one sounds the most more Chicago person like ever. the place True. they're from than Michael Mann sounds like he's from Chicago. <laughs> this is like hearing Mick Jagger and being like, where is he Where's from? Where is he from? What is he, Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> the way he says blacks when I was talking to him about the prints, the, yeah. the Dolby print. He was describing the difference between a Dolby print and a laser print to me, I think. That's what it was. I have the transcript and I'm going to listen to it and probably like loop it and make it some kind of ambient thing I listen to yeah. when I go to sleep or whatever. Just Michael Mann talking about Dolby prints to me. But yeah, the blacks are uh, much run higher. Run it through your hatch. <laughs> right, yeah, you go to just, sleep every night. Um, slow it down, maybe. It's Hosley style. Um... But uh, yeah, he's a Chicago dude, which makes it all the funnier that he made a movie about a guy who basically never left yeah. like a province of Northern Italy, right? Sure, like yeah. that's the whole thing with Enzo Ferrari. He makes this like global brand, but he's not fucking going anywhere. And, and rarely goes to the races. Like you know, his all, big yeah. trip is to go see his mistress, right. like yeah. across town or wherever yeah. she yeah. is. Like that. that's that's his, I mean, the, the emotional, so the ending of this movie is the Mila Mila happens. It's crazy. The young driver, um, uh, uh, De Portago, mm -hmm. who's played by Gabriel Leone, who's not an actor I know. He uh, was on a big Netflix show, I want to say. Dom? Uh, let's yes, see. Yes, I think that's Dom. what it is. Yeah. It's an Amazon show. Okay. Michael Mann said he cast him from that. Very handsome. Yes. Very much like a, you know. Young Italian race car driver, right? Yes. I, I, I think he's Spanish, he's Spanish but yeah. like he's got the vibe of like. What and, he, and, and that's one of the liberties I think this movie kind of takes is Deportago. Uh, he's at the Brazilian. Time, I'm sorry. Oh, he's Brazilian. Brazilian. Okay. Yeah. Um, Deportago at the time was like a huge figure. Like he was mm. a huge celebrity. Right. It, he, like he, a global. He, the, the kiss. Yeah. He, there's this famous photo of yeah. him kissing his girlfriend. Yeah. The kiss of death. It's yeah. called the kiss of death. Yeah. Like uh, like it was the last time anyone yeah. took a picture of him before he you know. 
crashed his car into yeah. a bunch of people. Yeah. Um, but, By mistake. But, he didn't mean to. <laughs> no, he, he didn't did. mean to. He's yeah. not stuntman Mike. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> God, right. But, right, the Mila Mila, which is a thousand-mile drive people Too fast. would do Too fast. through the streets of Italy. Not the right the place to do Italy. it. Don't do it. Do it far away from anybody. The, the, the narrow go, streets of Italy. You would go 500 miles in one direction and kind of turn around, right? Yeah. You would usually have a navigator with you with a map telling sometimes, you what to do. Except yeah. if you're Dempsey, yeah. who's done yeah. it so many times, he knows how to do it. Yeah. Dempsey's character basically averages like 100 miles an hour the entire time, right? Except, except for the time when he gives a little lift to Jean Berra, the, the, the Maserati driver right. whose car breaks down. Uh, which is funny, right? Yeah, that guy's hilarious. out and he's like, oh, sure, ride with me. <laughs> like, it's insane that, I mean, the answer, you're like, how did people not die doing this? The answer is like, they, they did. Do. They died they all did. the what time. And like, it's like, it's just after World War II and everyone was just like closer to this stuff. Well, it's in a way, it's just like, oh, sure, like, like we a, live in this chaotic time. A sport where everyone accepts you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet, except the eggs are going like, please let me break myself. <laughs> I want the risk. I want the juice of put potentially me, ending up in, in an that omelet. frying pan, baby. Right. right. And they win. Um, uh, Deportago dies, obviously, yeah. but uh, you know, the other Ferrari cut driver, in half. Uh, Dempsey, Did he? Yes, it's horrifying. In, to either of you in interviews talk about the family? That they cut to in the middle of the race and the older brother. I, I've read interviews about that. Yeah. Yeah. When they uh, were like scouting. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. And right going here. to the real place. And then he, a family came out and was like, you're doing that? And this we old guy. We are the descendants of those people. No, right. the old guy he, he, he talked saw to it. is the younger brother. Right. Yeah. Who right, watches right. it happen. And he was like, we were at home. We were having dinner. We heard the sound. My brother ran out. He was taller than me like, and faster than me. He got there before I did. And Michael Mann was like, well, that's going directly in the movie. Yeah. But he he heard that firsthand from the grown up version of that small child. Um, it's obviously the car crash is is uh, very distressing beyond upsetting. Uh, it's depicted. I was really worried. I think that it would be like gory or something. That's the but, scary thing is it's not gory. It happens yes, so quickly. It happens There's so quickly so... and then the sort of carnage afterward is sort of horrifying to behold. Yeah. But it's honestly emotionally, you know, obviously just way more devastating than actually like what you're seeing. Well, because also Although it's... what you're seeing is bad. Yeah, know. but it's also like it's so bad that you can barely process it and it is gory but gory in a way that is so unlike the language we're used to of like zombie movie gore you know yeah. where you're like oh this is just actual human destruction it is not done for visual shock factor there's a weird mundanity to like oh suddenly a bunch of people are just missing their heads it reminds and you of it how, takes a second to process it reminds you of how just like fragile we are yes I mean, when you see humans just mowed down just so indiscriminately yes I mean and that's the thing about this Le Mans footage from 1955 when you see it you're just like Oh my God, those are people right. that it's just like slicing through. And it, you know? you, it just doesn't process where you're like, that's like a bunch of mannequins getting knocked over. Yeah. And then your brain starts noticing like, oh wait, there's blood. Right. And he, he like slowly tracks across it's, the carnage. It is truly is... masterful stuff. Now I want to say, I was not asking for any conventional sense of resolution from this movie. I am into Michael Mann's characters <laughs> living in emotionally unresolved gray spaces, right? Uh, either dying, uh, you know, by the side of highways or on public transit <laughs> unresolved, or just continuing on with their life unresolved or whatever that is. But at this moment in the movie, when this happens, and I did not know the true story, and it is so shocking on screen, I was like, holy shit, the stakes of this thing just went through the roof. Right. How does he fucking handle the fallout of this? Right. And the movie ends very quickly after that. Yeah. And it's not like I was looking for closure, but when but that- it doesn't give it to you. When that right. scene happens, I thought, did I not realize this movie is three hours long? Right. <laughs> because certainly there has to be another hour of story of this, of watching this man further emotionally crumble. I don't think there's any easy way out. But I assume this movie is going to want to sit in the wake. And it doesn't, really. It gets out within, like, ten minutes. It, and it doesn't tell you how he weathered this. No. It tells you, like, Ferrari was absolved. Like, it wasn't yeah. their fault. Like, the car was not responsible for the crash. Right. He hit this thing but, on the but, road. But we, we hear about how he responded to the earlier incidents before, I mean, it's, you know, the, that line, Enzo build a wall, right. that he said to himself, which was yeah. basically, these awful things are going to happen, 
and you have to like divorce yourself from it. Right. And right. and we and he see he treats the press like hostile, right. you know, uh, people basically. Yeah. Like and, we see, and we see how upset he is. That's yeah. the other thing. I mean, we yes. see how and in fact even with that the test driver who dies, not the test driver, but during the test drive, mm-hmm. the guy and who dies early in front of the fact that he doesn't seem to care at all. Obviously it affects yeah. him. No, yes. but like but like we see that scene with him and Penelope Cruz because well, because that remember that's that's when Deportago comes and and says, you know, introduces himself I want again. The race for you. Yeah. And after the guy dies, you know, Enzo says, Deportago, call my office in the morning. Yeah, and right. it's just like the, the music cuts out and it's just like such an abrupt ending. But then we see him with, um, we see him with, uh, with, with Penelope Cruz and she's the one who's actually being kind of cold hearted about this. And he's arguing for like making sure that his family, the driver's family gets stuff. So you do see this like he's one way, you know, in public right. and yes. in another way in private. And and she's, of course, further removed from the right. people. She's the managing the books or whatever. Right. So, right, she's like, well, I don't want to do this. And, and like, she's no, lost everything. It. So she does not give a right. shit she's, if other people's families are dying. She's maybe lacking empathy yeah. currently. She's, she's I mean, lost but your, your letterbox uh, uh, line on this, David, was like, Michael Mann makes another movie about how masculinity is a cage. But I didn't say that in an angry way. I said no, that no, in no. a happy way. No, you, you said it with multiple exclamation points <laughs> and swooning hard eye emojis. <laughs> Um, That's going to be being a prison. I mean, it just feels like Enzo and uh, Laura are both like imprisoned in this movie, no, right? Well, like, and they're I trying to figure say, their way out. Yes. I think most of his movies are about these men where you're like, these men are emotionally shut down. I mean, uh, my favorite thing you've ever said about Michael Mann when we were discussing Thief is like, this is the ultimate Michael Mann moment is James Kahn's monologue where he's got, like, I got one feeling. It's right here in my wallet and it's <laughs> tightly folded up, right? Like, that's the ultimate distillation of everything Michael Mann you want wants. It? Right, where he just, like, unfolds a piece I mean, of paper. that's what De Niro is like in Heat, obviously. Right, he's like, this is my one right, emotion. Right, 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 right. I allow myself one and I never let it out of my it's sight. It's here in my oh, leather God. bifold. Yeah, right. And yeah. you'll never understand, right? And these guys who are, like, so tough and shut down and controlled, who build a wall, all that shit. But, like, no, if you actually look at it, all of his movies are about, like, unbelievably fragile men. Oh, like, yeah. men who are arguably too sensitive to handle the world. And so they build these prisons around themselves. They build personas. They build acts that allow them the control. It's why Manhunter was interesting, I'm sure, yes. which is basically oh, yeah. about a man who feels too much, right? right? Yeah. You know, like, it's you're 100% and right. A, a guy who feels too much, and the Manhunter character is the guy who doesn't build the protective wall around himself, and he's fucked. Like, he's yeah. dead inside. He's let the world kill him, basically. Right. Whereas these other guys, it's like, Enzo's like, oh, no, too bad, I mean, someone died. And you're like, this guy is overcome with emotion. Collateral's, like, about, like, two personalities, right? Like, the ice-cold killer yes. and the ultra-emotional loser, and they, like, turn into one person as they're driving right. around, right? You know, like, shit like that. But there's like, he finds different of, like, ways into it. These defensive structures and personas that these guys, like, build around themselves. What a guy Michael Mann is making these movies yeah. for us. But there's the scene where I guess it's whatever the final checkpoint pit stop is where he checks in with each of his racers. Right. And you see him adjust the language and the energy of how he coaches each one of them. Right. And you're like, oh, this guy is actually extremely emotionally intelligent. Right. Like this isn't even strategic. He understands which guy... He understands which guy he needs to, like, yeah. sort of hardball, which guy yeah. he, needs he needs to, like, to hold up. gently, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. who he needs to, like, you know, cut down to size. And then the moment where he asks for the autograph for his son, yeah, that's, like, the one time he ever kind of fully belies a real sense of feeling and vulnerability to someone. Because even to Penelope Cruz, he has the confession where she's, like, is this woman different from the other ones? Right. When they're talking about Shailene Woodley, and he's like, I fell in love with her. I'm still in love with her. And it's like, that's the most devastating thing he can possibly say. And you believe that he means it, but also he doesn't even really project that energy when he says it to her. And as much as he seems much more comfortable with Shailene Woodley, I wouldn't say he seems particularly loving. He doesn't seem happy exactly, but he no. seems calm. He seems he's relaxed. Calm. That, that, yes. that, that little moment when he bites the plate. Yeah, he yeah has I love little, that little moment. Right. Those but little gestures. Like, and it's so obvious that it's, it. it's a sanctuary yeah. for him. But right? that's like, his yeah. love language is being calm. Like, it's not like he feels outwardly warm, even when he's being kind to the child or to her. Right. Yeah. And he was a philanderer, as she's saying, but oh, yeah. like, not, that's not in this movie because that's not important to this movie. Right. Like, but it's talked about there a lot. Are hint, about. There are hints of it, too. Right. Like, yeah. Like when he says to, to that, to that racer's uh, girlfriend, he says, the I, movie I, I, yeah. I knew your mother. 
<laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just like that awkward little pause and you're just like, Ooh, and again, like, nigga. it's a small town, basically. Yeah. Like, yeah. everyone knows everything here. That, that's another thing in this movie is I'm like, you could believe that there are 10 other Ferrari children. Oh, yeah. That not only right. do we not know about, but he, he doesn't, doesn't know even. About. Right. Sure. Uh, because, like, Lara not knowing about um, Linda Lardy, Alina uh, Lardy, sorry. Yeah. She doesn't want to know. She right. could know, right? Like, she's been holding. She's not yeah. looking. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. She's been not looking. The, the guy at the bank just so directly waves it in front of her face right. by mistake that she, that she can't to, ignore it has anymore. To, right. I love right. that guy. The guy He's at the good. bank is... He is so haughty. ...making a meal of his little little performance there. Yeah. Do Italians like this movie, or will they like this movie? You saw it at Venice. I mean, it's a movie with a bunch of non-Italians playing famous Italians. But then, like... A, and then an ensemble of real right. Italians. The, the cast right. is 90% real Italian guys, just yeah. not the primary. I understand they, that's been an approach to making movies about their country their entire existence. I mean, yeah, I Love You to Death, for example, one of the great films about the Italian experience, which <laughs> very we sensitive, covered on this show. Very nuanced. Um, but, uh, like, yeah, do they, how mad are they? Like, so they're not like France about Napoleon. That's like number one reaction, yeah. <laughs> negative reaction that a country can have to a movie. It's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I gathered in, at Venice, the reaction was muted yeah, from the, I didn't get the sense that the Italian press was particularly into the movie, but. But they didn't like anything, right? Yeah, they didn't like anything. Yeah, they are always fucking whining those. They love Five Nights at Freddy's, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> like, because it was, it was like what the killer Ferrari. They're like th maestro. All these movies that kind of just went over like lead balloons. But in then Venice. poor things had like the most rapturous response yeah, of any a, movie ever. It's a very European yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was, I, I'm, I was myself not the biggest fan of Maestro or the Killers. Yeah, so, I know you're you know, wrong. I'm, yeah. you know, a yeah. bad person. Rare um, elves. You are a bad that. person, and I will tell you. <laughs> um, okay, we can't play the box office game. No, I have, I have no idea how this movie will do. Like, I don't think it'll do amazing. Again, I think the play is more Europe. It'll, it'll make some money on Christmas just from like the adult market, right? Like, you know. That's my question. Movie they, for grown-ups. They've marketed it well. They have. I, think, I yeah. don't think this movie is going to uh, uh, hold. I don't think, I don't imagine it will have long legs at the box office. I'm mostly curious, how many people do they trick into seeing this opening weekend? Like, this feels like the, what's it called? George Clooney's The American where Good they like, movie, though. But, yes, like, yeah. they, they created the exact poster Not and trailer that felt most like a thriller where people were like, well, George Clooney in a suit with a gun. And the opening weekend, it did well, and then everyone went like, no, thank you. But this is not the kind of bait and switch that the American Not is. to I mean, the, the, the American no. is, I mean, like, two hours of George Clooney assembling a gun. Yeah. Are you sure <laughs> he fucking files down uh, all the bits and pieces? He screws I, things in? I mean, I, I think, actually, the, the last trailer I saw for Ferrari, I think does a good job of conveying the kind of movie it is. Yes. He, and it has not, big emotions. I mean, it has great racing sequences. It's it a, does. You know, it's, it's an, I think it's a, actually a very entertaining movie. Bill um, is wearing a giant neon sweatshirt right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's just, like, this Christmas, this Christmas. This is the ad this read. <laughs> You've got movies for family. So you have like Wonka, mm -hmm. you know, you have The Color Purple. Sure. You have, I mean, that's actually not a movie for families exactly, but yeah. it's sort of a... It's a movie for families where the kids have grown up. Yeah, I mean, I don't right? know what to, I, This is my whole thing with The Color Purple where I watch, and I, I can talk about this now, I guess, right? You know, because it'll have come out. Yeah. But like where I'm just like, who the fuck wants a musical, like an uplifting musical about this? I don't understand this. It was a hit musical. It, it was. It did, what, but, but, also, twice. It did. but also, you know, I mean, I was a, a kid when The Color Purple, the, yeah, Spielberg, the Spielberg Color Purple yeah. movie opened. And, and that was a big hit. And that was a movie that like that movie kids is went to. Good. Yes. And it was, right. It yeah. sort of is in that weird family zone, even though it's about very, very distressing things. Like... But you also, know. that was the era where more movies had the sort of Oppenheimer thing of like, we have a cultural it's obligation a big, to see yeah, this. Cultural. Yeah. This movie. is a right. major director working on a major subject. Big we book. all have yes. to go. But okay, so there's Wonka. There's um, Aquaman you know, Two. Aquaman Two. The Lost Ooh. Kingdom. There's Migration. Yeah, uh, I still don't know what that movie is. Uh, it's uh, Terrence Malick's new film. Yeah. It's about yeah. birds. No, I, I, ha I have some news for you. I don't <laughs> think the director, writer, or producers of that film know what that movie is. I, I saw a trailer there, for it, and I still don't remember. No, there's it, the yeah. boys in the it boat, is, which you have told which me I, is like a plus mid filmmaking from Clooney. I, I, right? I've like, seen the boys in the boat. I've seen it twice. Seen it twice, <laughs> folks. He got back in the boat. Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a crew dad now. 
Oh, you're you're yeah, I'm, I'm a crew oh, okay. now. So so I had some you know just vested interest in seeing you have it. your own boy in his own boat these yeah, i have all, my own boy in i have a boy um, in a boat Dave, these have, just all feel like movies that are going to make like 10 to 20 million dollars except for aquaman which will make more but you know obviously feels a little I, doomed yeah. right or will it have right. you seen the the migration trailer that is like 75 percent footage from other illumination movies no I, oh, I, I did I see this. That, I did see this the same play. as that that final The Marvels trailer that's all like Downey Jr. and Chris Evans. And they're like, remember <laughs> other Marvel movies? That trailer being released like two days before this, that yes, movie came this, out the was... The stink it on was that trailer. Sad. It was sad. Yeah, like, don't I don't think do that, that trailer don't might have actually taken 10 million out of yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. But yes. all of the migration trailers do that. And you're like, this isn't even like the teaser trailer a year out. Right. This movie's coming out and the trailer is like 40% minions, yeah, 20% like secret sing? life yeah, like, yeah, right. It's At like, the end, they're like, and now meet our geese. Movie, <laughs> movie as bottle episode. <laughs> yeah. Like a bottle episode. Well, they used to have those. They used to have like that. The that's entertainment movies and stuff like films bring that them, were just bring basically back. Sure. one studio Memes. is like here yeah. are some of the best scenes from our movies. What about Vine movies? the movie? We just do a seventy minute movie that's just everyone's favorite vines that they forgot. You know? I had I had to, 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 to drop a name, but the past and future guests. I had the best ringing. conversation with Paul F. Tompkins about that's entertainment and like sure. trying to explain that to someone today, where you're like they used to make supercuts, right? Put them in theaters, and they were huge hits. Or demo, like this is Cinerama. Yeah, like the demo reel. Terror in the Isles. Or just anytime you look up those, you know, old box offices, and it's like, what was this movie? And it's like it's just fucking hot air balloon footage for ninety minutes. It's right. just people just wanted to see something. <laughs> and it was a number pretty. three movie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, Sixty-five. You know, where it's just like around the world with the balloons, like, and it, you know, it's... or like the what was it called? The Search for Noah's Ark. Where, well, the, I love oh, those. Oh, but, yeah, those, they some model? pseudo scientific nonsense. But right. you know, like a thing that could only exist in a pre internet era where they bought a bunch of TV ads and people were like, fuck, they might have actually found it, but no one could communicate that the movie was full of shit once the screening started. They made us watch that fucking thing Everyone had school. to find out for themselves. <laughs> Everyone had to go and see it and be like, I wish someone had told me. Oh, boy. <laughs> Um, so I, yeah, I mean, Iron Claw is sort of the only other movie coming out around this Christmas that's question. making the play for kind of like the grown up audience. Mm -hmm. And Iron Claw is like a power ballad movie. But and I this feel is like, like that's an opera movie. Break out. Have you seen Iron Claw? I haven't seen it. It's I an excellent like film. That film's going to. I know Dave is a big fan. Break out commercially. And maybe I'm wrong about this. I think that it's going to, um, do fairly well. Uh, and then hold quite well. It's A24, and I do, right? Yes. It's A24. I think A20, I don't have no, this is me completely off the top of my head. It's yeah. not like they've told me this, but like I imagine they, they're they hoping for like kind of like a 40 to 50, you know, that would be like really yeah. good for them, right? Yeah. Like on this like dark movie about suicide and But misery. it also like it's coming M out. Make up the money that Bo is afraid lost. Yeah. Hell it's yeah. coming out on Christmas and it like isn't going wide until the second week of right. January and there's kind of nothing else in January. Yes, that's obviously the other thing is it's just we have this weird winter ahead right. of like not a lot of movies. Like if I'm Netflix, I would put Rebel Moon in theaters, but I'm not. I'd put the Hitman in theaters. Remember when they made yeah. that fucking deal because they wanted to, a guarantee would come out by the end of 2023 and that's why they claim they took Netflix over the other distributors who would have held it until 24 everybody, and now the movie isn't going on Netflix Everybody this year. keeps falling for this. It's driving me crazy. Don't fucking fall for it. You listening, Richie? But movie's good though. But like drives Great me movie. insane that they were like, well, but Fox Searchlight would have kept it until 24 so we have to go with Netflix. Guess what? That's where it belongs, is 2024, and it'll do great, except it's going to be on Netflix, so maybe it won't. But Ferrari, I predict $9 million opening weekend, but like 12 over the five day. I have no idea. I don't know what to predict for this right. movie. I don't either. Like, I In predict solid European numbers. Yeah. I predict, like, kind of like neither fish nor fowl results, right? Look, like, it'll be like not a failure, but not like it's a It's kind of in an ideal place because STX went under. Where you're like the distributor who it's now sort of has free it. money for neon. Yeah. That's a good right. point. Yeah. yeah. Right? I, I, don't know. I mean, this movie has come out right now, right? Like, as, as yes. of yes. As this of, episode like, is airing, it's been out for a week this, or so. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. we'll look like idiots if we predict anything. We That's will. True. We will. And yet I'm addicted to Well, this to is the fun like of an it. Idiot. <laughs> yeah. Um, will Michael Mann make Heat 2? He wrote he, this book. He, he really wants to make Heat 2. With a collaborator. The idea sounds crazy to me. Yeah. Have but, you, what, what's the idea? I thought Would, Top Gun Maverick was crazy too. Yeah. You know, I mean, yes. 
So it's basically a prequel and sequel, right? Have it's you read the, you yes. read the novel? I mean, it's, yeah, it's a prequel and sequel. Although it's funny because when he talks about it, he talks about it as if it were a only prequel. a prequel. Right, right. Because when I talked to him about it, he's like, you know, the, the challenge is like finding out, you know, who, who can play these guys? Who, 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 who can be the kind of person that can then become, you know, Robert De Niro, Neil McCauley, which I'm like, like, well, what about like, or, you know, talking about Chris Harris or whatever. It's like, well, what about the guy that's going to be him after, <laughs> right. you know? Right. But that's why I almost wonder if his notion for the movie is you don't do the sequel part of it and you only do the prequel. Because when he talks about it as a film, that's the only part he's mentioned. Right. And, and, and I've asked him about this, too. He, he hasn't answered. can't really do it with Val today. No. Yeah. I, th I think maybe in his mind, he he's thinking, I, I don't know this for a fact. This is yeah. just me, me speculating. I wonder if he's thinking, we'll do the prequel. Yes. Like. That's a film. Right. Because at the time, I mean, at the time I interviewed him also, the, the, the strike was still on. So he, he was kind of like. Like he could talk about stuff like, oh, he you could know. be like, I love Dan and Driver, who I just worked with in this movie that right. has a waiver. <laughs> like, right. You know, but also, right. Every right. But, but, but he could talk about an event they're stuff. doing together. They still basically keep on saying, like, wouldn't it be fun if we did Heat two together? Right. Yeah. It, it, assuming Driver would be playing De Niro. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it, if it happens, I mean, I don't think anybody's greenlit this thing yet. I mean, no. I think it's very much a kind of who. I mean, I think Michael Mann is is one of those guys. He's like. I will just talk about this movie until it just becomes kind of a fate accompli. Who else has to owns Heat, if anyone? It was a it, Warner Brothers movie, right? Is but it like, not New Regency? It might be Regency. Like, ha, like, like, does he need anyone, or can anyone make Heat too? I guess is that is the question. It went like could any studio sweep in tomorrow on and be home like Heat video? Too? It went from in the last five years being a Warner Brothers title to being a Fox title. Yeah, it's which it's, makes it's me think New Regency thing, has yeah. the underlying rights. Right. Period. Okay, right. but that that's that's no big deal because correct they can go anywhere. They right. can go anywhere. Um, so he should just do that. That'll get you can greenlight a prequel to anything now. That, that's the thing. It's like his one franchise thing he can kind of point to, and a movie whose cultural value just keeps increasing. Right. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd watch a Miami Vice sequel. <laughs> well, we all would. <laughs> okay. What is the... Okay. So you'd have to... That That is so crazy to me because it's like, you'd have to get Farrell on board. Now, Colin Farrell's stock is kind of hotter than ever. Yeah. That movie represents a tough time he, in his, his life. His personal... Well, well you, could, you could pretend like he never made it because he yeah. doesn't remember making... Yeah, you making, could be like, we're making Miami Vice too. You just you don't yeah, say the two. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Did you sneeze? It, it, uh, sure. Yeah. Exciting well, new project bless. taking Miami over voice. from a two. Taking over from the beloved Don Johnson. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. For the first time. <laughs> you never had this conversation. You keep before. saying that in press. Where yeah. It's like, yeah, I studied the performance. You're going to be the second person to ever play Crockett. <laughs> so for the second time. Jamie Foxx and Michael Mann had a tough time making that yes, movie they together, did, yes. and I they never made a movie again after. Yes. And Jamie having Fox made like a, four movies together before, yeah. tough, tough health round. Yeah. He has, seems to maybe be on the other side of it. He now. seems to be on the other side of it. He just absolutely shattered the backboard with the greatest <sighs> performance given in cinema within the Burial. I don't know if you've seen the Burial. Have you gotten Burial? That's the, the movie burial. to see. Eight I've times. seen the Burial. How many yes. times have you seen the Burial? I've only seen it once. But you uh, gotta take he, out he, that he, trouble. He's, he's very good in the Burial. He's great in that film, but like. Could he and man patch things up? I mean, I don't think I don't think a I, know. I just like the thought happen. experiment. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, Naomi Harris is hotter than ever. Justin yeah. Thoreau, get him back. Yeah, fucking the guy from The Wire. Everyone loves him. Barry Shabaka Henley is like, did he make it? Yeah, he he still is. Yeah. Wait, didn't he die? No. Okay, did, no, he's stronger no, than ever. No, right? Wait, no. What are you talking about? Barry Shabaka Henley. No, he's so oh, Barry Shabaka Henley. Okay, yeah, just yeah, yeah. Okay, check in. Okay, 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 you really scared me for a second there. Uh, well, because he played, um, you know, he played uh, Castilla, right? Like, it's an important role. Yeah. Okay. Gong Lee, get her back. Get her back. All right, fine. You don't want to play this game with no, me. No, no, I mean, I, I I would love to see that. I, I mean, look, I love Miami Vice. You know this. Um, I, we both love it. I mean, here's the thing. It's like, again... Anytime anyone announces a prequel or a sequel to anything, yeah. a part of me dies. Of course. Still, even to this day, even the age, I, I die a lot. Yeah. Um, but but <laughs> then, died many times. I, yeah, I, I died many times. But but then uh, but then something like Maverick comes out, and I'm just like, well, if you're gonna make it like that, yeah, I'm all for it. You know? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I mean. But you're some, right that that's a movie that shouldn't work. It's also a movie that is far better than its predecessor. Absolutely. Yeah. But obviously, it can't exist without its predecessor. Right. I mean, Heat is on my sight and sound list. So, so the yeah. idea of them making a sequel to it is kind of like, 
I mean, I'll see, I'll see it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like. I weirdly would not be worried about the legacy of Heat being affected by a Heat sequel. No. If that makes sense. It's also the fact that he like soft launched it with the book, you know? Where yeah. it's like, okay, so people have had their time to like sit with his notions of the continuation and people generally like the book. And the book is fascinating. I mean, right. the, the book reads like... You know, like somebody just like Michael Mann just like opened up his brain and just yes. like let everything pour out. I yeah. mean, it's like a greatest hits kind of thing. And it's, you know, if if that's what Heat 2 winds up being as a movie, I, I can't imagine that I wouldn't enjoy that. No, I'm looking at your, your site. And <laughs> well, and I just, I don't know to what degree at this point it's like internet fan casting that's getting re-reported as rumor. Or this is actually the indication, but everyone just always says, well, it would just be Adam Driver and Oscar Isaac and Austin Butler, right? Like, that's the assumption hmm. that those are the three guys. I've never seen High Tide, the Jillian High Armstrong is, movie uh, that High you Tide put on your great, sight and sound list. Great. Another movie that mm. first time I saw it, I was a little mixed on. Wow. Um, but also, actually, uh, reminds me of what you were saying about uh, reviews of films. Like, High Tide, for me, is, is one of those films. I remember it, it opened in D.C. when I was a kid, 87, and I read, I believe, a Washington Post review of it that was mixed. Okay. But it did the thing that I think all reviews sh should do, ideally, which is it gave me such a sense of the movie that I could read it and say, oh, this sounds interesting. Mm. Like, I sh I want to go see this movie. This yeah. sounds like something I would enjoy. And I went and saw it, and I was, I enjoyed it, but I was mixed on it. I mean, it was, you know, I was 14. Um, and then over the years, as I kept revisiting, I was like, no, no, this is actually one of the greatest films I've ever seen. Uh, Bill Guy, I just have to push back on what you're saying. That's not the job of a critic. A job of a film critic is to tell people that their taste in movies that they've already established is good. And that's why you have to rank the most successful films as the top films of any given year. This is true. If you pick an obscure movie, you're just the showing The role off. of a critic is to collect checks <laughs> every day yeah. from every studio to lick their boots yep. over and over again. No, yeah. no, 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 no. From from Disney. Just from Disney. Just, Disney. Disney. Just from Disney. Just from Disney, yes. who tells us well, I mean, uh, I... the, the new Zack Snyder movie coming out uh, from Warner Brothers. Right. Uh, your mission uh, <laughs> is to destroy that Sandbag, movie yeah. and destroy him. Yeah. Uh, and in return, we will give you $100. Yeah. <sighs> God, I love those hundred smackers. Yeah. I buy so many sandwiches. They are Mickey bucks. You have to. Yeah, they're Mickey bucks. The Disney bucks. dollars. I can only get <laughs> Mickey sandwiches. Yeah. Um, but uh, that is why um, I uh, am the way I am. No, I don't know. When I put Oppenheimer on my list, someone at Universal emailed me the same day being like, hey, what's your address? And then he replied again like a minute later being like, I realize this actually looks kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> We're sending out a screen or whatever. We're not sending you a check. Well. <laughs> it was funny. Um, thanks for coming, Bilga. I don't know. We're done with Ferrari, right? Yeah, you're the best. It was uh, inexcusably long time since we'd had you on. Let's do Malik. Do Tree of Life. I mean, bring, we're bring talking. Back. We, we've we've been talking more and more recently about doing Malik, which feels like an obvious one to bring you on for. I I just wrote Tree of Life on your sight and sound list. That's why I Tree of Life it. is absolutely on my sign. And if and if Tree of Life didn't exist, Days of Heaven would be on there. Days of Heaven now in theaters. Although yeah. I guess by the time this, I just filed a review of Days of Heaven, which just feels so surreal. That's fun. Yeah, first time I've ever written about that film, which is amazing. To wow, me. I can that, see Days of Heaven. That would film. be oh. that would be on my personal what sight is? and sound. It's a yeah. good movie. Yeah. And look, if if it, locusts. if it wasn't on there, it'd be because I'm feeling saucy and I'd flip in New World instead. Yeah. But Days I would unquestionably put one of the two. Out. Has never been my Malik. But what, what is I your Malik? I love it, Thin Red Line. Oh, yeah. yeah. See, I'd say, um, I'd say New World is my Malik, but, like, but if Thin I'm trying Red Line to was the first one I saw. address what is what are the top ten. You know what? Badlands was the first one I saw, which yeah. I love. It's yeah. a great movie. Uh, but Thin Red Line was the first one where I was like, "This, I understand this on some level. I can't articulate." Right, I'm that was I saw New old. World in theater. Right. Yeah. The New cut, World fucking rocks. I I saw it in those three days before they removed the first cut from the theaters, the, 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 uh, and it blew my fucking. The, see, this is why we got to do Malik. The journey of no, the Terrence Malick movies in theaters yeah. that, that I've been through is, you know, I remember I, I went to see Thin Red Line when it came. Oh, out. like opening day. Right. It was like Christmas release, if I remember correctly. It was. That's right. And, and I went to like the first show at at. Uh, the Ziegfeld mm. and m morning show. Um, right. And I just Jeff sat there. I, I, ironically enough, I ran into a friend from high school, um, but we were right. we were sitting there and you just heard over the course of the next three hours, just like, 
Yeah, right. <laughs> of seats. Of people's yes. seats uh, folding back up as they left the theater. One of those guys was just... George Clooney. He was like, yeah. where am I? I don't see myself anywhere. I mean, it was it was, it was was hilarious. And then, and I remember the New World when I, I, I actually went to like press screenings for that. But then I went to one of those all medias where, where they actually invited like, regular civilians to see it and right. afterwards there we, were people we want a hot crowd for you guys. yeah yeah <laughs> afterwards there were people in the lobby like total strangers bonding over how much they hated that Absolutely. i remember these like right. this woman walked out and she saw another woman and she pointed at her and started laughing and saying you hated it as much as i did didn't you and they both started laughing these two people they'd never met before and they're like, like, like yeah. it was like People Cinema who'd been brings through, people together. It was people who'd been through I, a battle together. I was in high school when it came out, and I I think I saw it four times in theaters, and I kept dragging friends to see it, and they were like, "What the fuck are you I, on about?" I dragged people a friend get angry. At I me. dragged a friend the first time, and then I didn't make that's the thing. Again. It was like this fool me thrice thing where I was like, "Why do I keep thinking I can bring fifteen year olds, and they're gonna have the same reaction that I did?" Somebody came. Well, people would come up to me, not knowing I was a critic and not knowing I was a huge fan of this film, yeah. just randomly telling me how much they hated the new world yeah. right. like i'd be at a right. party and somebody would come up to me and you know like, what I have you seen saw. this movie called the new world it's right. like the worst piece of shit i've ever seen and i'm like i've seen it like six times all right <laughs> i love it perhaps you know? one of the great films ever made <laughs> yep um but yeah no the the real weirdness is we didn't have you on for kubrick that was a uh, a fuck up on our part it's all right in terms of the I've big talked about Bilga Kubrick filmmakers. a lot. I've yeah. talked about Kubrick a lot. Yeah, We've all talked about Kubrick a lot. We're not going to ever do it again, thank God. <laughs> if he makes a new film, <laughs> David. David, if he makes a new film, we Should, are... Would we cover if that Napoleon series ever happened? Ooh, interesting. Assuming Fukunaga is probably not involved. That's a real, we make a decision closer to. Yeah, you right. guys did do Fear and Desire, right? On the Kubrick yeah, thing? Sure okay. Yeah, sure Yeah, yeah. We did fascinating, a mixed feelings on that film, but uh, which know. is also not the being best. restored. There, there's like a new 4K restoration so, that as so well. Th getting re -released. The funny thing about Fear and Desire is, um, for many years, as you know, it was impossible to yeah, see, and buried. Kubrick wouldn't allow people to see it. I went to college, and, and in college, um, it turned out my uh, the guy who ran the film study center at Yale had a 16 millimeter copy print of Fear and Desire wow. that he had gotten when he was like working at like a 60 millimeter rental house as a teenager and they just had a copy there and they sold it to him for like $5 or something. And that was the print that the Museum of Modern Art had struck its print from. Oh, wow. And he was like, this is the only place where you'll ever be able to see this movie. And he just like pr projected it for me. Um, and I, that was, you know. I cannot remember who it is, but at one of these disgusting New York media elite post-screening cocktail soirees, I was talking to someone about the podcast and directors we covered and brought up Kubrick. And they said, have you seen Fear and Desire? And I went, yeah, no, we do. If we cover someone, we cover oh, all of their films. Right, yeah. And he said, my mother or grandmother is the woman in Fear and Desire. Oh, wow. The tree, tied to the tree, right? Yes. yes, and it was this, like, thing that for so long we were like, she was in Kubrick's first movie and none of us can see it. That's cool. And then finally got to see it. Anyway, if you're that person, remind me who you were, because I had this conversation I can't remember who it was with. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll just do another Fear and Desire episode. Yeah, and Bill, you'll come back on. That's your favorite one, right? Yeah, five hours on Fear and Desire. Oh, yeah. God. I think we made 90 minutes, maybe. Did we combine it with Killer's Kiss? I think we did. Yes. Yeah, we did do a combo episode okay. yeah, with yeah. Killer's Kiss. That's Which is also go. good. That's a, Killer's Kiss is good. Killer's yeah. Kiss is good. But, oh, fuck. You know what I found out tied to this? My grandmother is in Killer's Kiss. <gasps> what? She's in, like, the dance hall sequence. Cool. Wow. Like, in the background. Yeah, and she kept yeah. saying, I'm in the movie wearing a bright red dress. And I'm like, Grandma, it's I'm black and white. I'm not seeing around. shit. And I thought she was full of shit. And then she pulled it up on Criterion and it took a picture on her phone of the TV. And I'm like... That is her wow. in the scene. Knowing what I know about your grandmother, it's pretty impressive that she pulled something up on Criterion yeah, and took a picture say, of it. I don't, she's not, not a, a very savvy grandmother woman, thing. right? No. Yes. Well, so that, and, that took a lot of effort. Right. She sent me that photo and it was followed by a phone call of, my phone caught on fire. Can you come over and fix it? <laughs> <laughs> my TV's <laughs> All right. spitting at me. We could talk about. Poetic films that alienated audiences on sitting on their release. People's grandmothers in a release. It, it, is, kind of the, it is kind of the blank check ethos. That's it what is. you get to do after you I get think the blank check, right? I do think there's a whole generation of kids like me and Griffin who when like the those Malik movies came out, 
like were initiated into like another level of thinking about movies by Correct. that. No, yes. that was a real, uh, this has changed my perception of the language of cinema. And part of it is the culture around me being like, this movie is a stinker. Right. It's a it was flop. partly that. And there's partly like cineasts of an older generation telling me like, you don't understand how long we've been waiting for this. Right. And part of it was also, he did not make any movies in the eighties or sure for most didn't. of the nineties. Yeah. And as a result, Thin Red Line, even though it's very different from like a, a Days of Heaven, it feels like a movie made by someone who did not have to suffer through the film industry of the eighties. Yeah. It's just like, right. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do this, I'm back, baby. <laughs> yeah, and I got this for you. I'll never be mad at Jim Caviezel because of that movie. Same here. Yeah, he well, can also, sound of freedom all he likes. Yeah. To be clear, he he I mean, should have stepped out. on the joke. I want to make. Oh, what were you about to say? I, 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 you, you said I'll never be mad at him because of uh, Thin Red Line. I was going to say that's how I feel about him in Sound of Freedom, and then you called out Sound of Freedom <laughs> as of a mistake. Well, that's what I was thinking of. Right, I was going to play the role of the fool. Right, right you understand right. the comedic <laughs> archetype of the fool. He made, he made some good movies. Yeah, he's made some so great. Sound of freedom. <laughs> <laughs> He just seems like a bit of an aggro dude, but you I know, him, him getting so, in the I think, water. I think right, he might be unwell. Starts? I think he might be unwell. I've, yeah. I've heard he's not great to work with. Yeah, but uh, Thin Red Line, though. Yeah. He's basically like great movie. the best. Great, so great, great, yeah. great, great yeah. movie. We'll do it one day. We'll do it. We we'll wanted have you to do it this summer. Over. We'll have you on for one day. And then we decided not to because Marie made a face. No, but we'll do it eventually. I think, I think to quote Marie, her response was bowling. <laughs> But that doesn't mean and we Dave won't and I do stepped it. outside and touched a tree. <laughs> yeah, right. I, twir I, twirled, I twirled up and down some stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Bilga, you're the best. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, I, I feel like I've said this to you before, but uh, uh, my mother's favorite episodes of the podcast, she listens selectively. Wow. But she always tunes in when you're on and Chris White's are on because you're <laughs> sophisticated adults <laughs> with relaxing voices. And she feels that's, like you elevate going on the, the intelligence profile. of the show. Um, anything specific you want to plug? I mean, all your writing on Ferrari has been great, Michael Mann. Uh, and, Thank you. Vulture? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm actually working on two other pieces about Ferrari, which will okay. probably have published by the time. Not the stuff to hear this. Yeah. That sounds great. <laughs> and yeah. uh, you're going to plug the additional five times you watch Ferrari between yeah, now and the, when the yeah, episode the, 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 comes by, out. The, by the time, now that I actually have like a screener of it, oh. all bets are off. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My son still hasn't seen it and he's, he wants to see it. I'm like, well, I guess that's what we're doing this weekend. <laughs> off to the races. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being here, Belga, and thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for associate producing this show and saying that she thinks Terrence Malick is boring. Thank you to AJ McKeon and Alex Barron for our editing, Joe Bowen and Pat Reynolds for our artwork, Liam Montgomery and the Great American all for our theme song, JJ Birch for enjoying another week of vacation. You can go to blankcheckpod.com for links to some real nerdy shit, including Blank Check special features, our Patreon, where we do commentaries on film series. We're doing the Terminator movies. We'll have just done The Love Guru to close out our Austin Power series. Easily one of the worst films we've ever talked about in any form. Absolutely. Ever. 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 Horrible movie. You've seen it. Oh, yeah. Eight times? <laughs> I'm trying to think if I've seen it more than once. No, I don't think so. You, that was that, a, that's the rare one and done for you. That's back when I was only watching movies once. Okay, <laughs> in my salad years. Wow, wow. Uh, well, you can check that out. Uh, and as always, I need to offer a very important correction. Uh, Shailene Woodley suntans her vagina, not her butthole. Is that how we want to end? It was an important, serious correction. Okay. <laughs>